Events begin with a huge battle reminiscent of a world war, but it's not all that simple. After all, the two warring factions are ruled by humans and they run their own game, each with their own tactics, and there is only one winner. One faction is under the command of a player named Nebula, while the other worships the god Hegemony. Each troop demonstrates its unique characteristics and strategies while under the control of its commanders. The protagonist Choi Song Woon, a player under the nickname Nebula, decides to strike with nuclear weapons. Even so, the Hegemony player was prepared for this outcome. Hegemony has struck back with its missiles, in the name of faith. Nebula realized they were interceptor missiles, the enemy had prepared well. But, the interceptor missiles couldn't keep up with his warheads. Suddenly, one of them headed towards the center of the enemy imperial palace, where a huge number of orgs prayed to their god Hegemony to save them. If this were real, prayers wouldn't save anyone. However, this is just a lost world. In him, faith and prayers are always productive, just as the spirit of the demon materialized, who, through their faith, saved the orgs from imminent death. Choi Sungwoon was not surprised by this outcome, as expected, the opponent was using the Holy Oak strategy. A player named Hegemony openly bragged about this strategy, as he had the second rank of the server, and ridiculed Nebula in every way for his attempts to somehow outdo his rival. It was clear to the boy now why Hegemony fought with such confidence. Though the peculiarity of the orc race and allows you to quickly expand the population of the people, how could he gain so much faith so quickly? He chose the sky, the largest space, and used special checks. Meanwhile, he was surreptitiously preparing to fight back against technological civilization. Attempting to summon the spirit of an apostle was also a good idea, however, it was obvious to Nebula. He realized that there was a space bigger than the sky, and that was what was above him. Hegemony was surprised that the enemy had weapons of mass destruction. He shouted to the demon spirit to stop it or it would destroy their entire palace. Nebula said it was impossible, several tungsten rods falling on him. And given the accumulated gravitational acceleration, it's too late, there's no stopping them. When the tungsten rod made contact with the ground, everything around it was destroyed. The emperor died and the underground temple was destroyed along with his palace. The faith that Hegemony had carefully nurtured had simply deteriorated. And when faith disappears, all the apostles disappear with it. In the end Nebula won the duel and remained in first place. The enraged Hegemony didn't realize what it was and demanded a rematch, next time he would definitely win. Nebula thought for a moment, but still decided not to accept his request. He wondered if he'd gotten something new but nothing ever happened. There were no updates to the game at all, he completed the achievement of holding the first ranked spot. Just before the guy decided to close the game, he suddenly got a notification. The system alerted that he was the only one who could achieve all the achievements. The guy was a bit confused, was it early access? Will there be an official release of the game? However, it is allowed to be shown privately before the official release. Eager to see what else this game had to offer, he agreed to this venture. In an instant, a multitude of incomprehensible codes appeared before his eyes. Upon waking up, he saw his in-game avatar named Nebula. Some sort of magic circle shone in front of him, and all around him were just stone ruins. The guy thought it was some kind of dream, but everything around him seemed too real. Some wanderer came up behind him and told him it wasn't a dream, the guy had been chosen. As it turned out, it was a woman who greeted the guy warmly, calling his name. He wondered how they knew his real name. And what did it all mean anyway? Looking around, Choi Sungwoon saw shadows. Were they really people like him? Wanderer said that some of the players already know her. They hide their faces to keep the game fair. And since everyone was already interested, she decided to get right to the point. Putting her hands up, she showed them the ground. This is the very place where our main character lived. A world he had seen many times before. The same lost world. Pointing to him, the woman said that in this lost world he had become a true god. Nebula heard nothing, but could feel her, the confusion of those around her. Wanderer said that this lost world is not just a game, it is a land abandoned by the gods of the past. There used to be an incredible civilization that thrived on this planet. Different races lived in harmony. However, for reasons unknown, the gods left this world. Because of this, it was time for new gods. She talked about how the Lost World game was created to find suitable candidates for the role of the god of this planet. Nebula can try to become a real god. 
it would be very similar to the lost world. No one will believe in him at first, but if he can give his people a reason to believe in him, Nebula will become the only god of this planet and will be able to do whatever she wants. All his dreams will become instantly realizable if he becomes god. The boy asked what would happen if he surrendered. The woman replied that if he surrendered now, he would go back to his world. However, the guy would forget everything that had just happened. He wondered, what if he gave up during the competition? The woman replied to him that he would no longer have that opportunity once the game started. The next question immediately followed, what would happen if he was defeated by another god? She replied that in that case he would have a divine end. Does that really mean they are all risking their lives? Did he have any reason to give up? The boy was adamant that he certainly didn't. The woman told him it was time to make a choice. If he wanted to surrender, he could do it now. And those who choose to continue will begin their adventure with a small race. He realized it was just like a game. So, he'd have to choose one of the lower races first. However, the people had already begun to give up. One by one they began to leave the lost world. Methinks the initial number of people converges to the maximum number of players, and there were 32. So there's only 27 left? Suddenly, the woman said he could be the first choice. Nebula wondered if the choice is given by place in the ranking system. Before I could say a word, the guy disappeared in a flash. Looks like a portal opened. He was transported to a small corner of land surrounded by a forest and a river. Different creatures lived in this river. However, they were very different from those who lived on the earth. In this world, frogs hunt fish and they can talk. Having caught a big fish, the frogs were glad that at last it was not bugs for dinner, but such a delicacy. Suddenly one of the frogs saw some unusual butterfly that happened to fly past them. They had never seen such a beautiful butterfly, which is why they focused their attention on it. That butterfly turned out to be one of Nebula's scouts. She told him about the humanoid frogs. Looking at the cards he realized that the small race of insects had the lowest percentage of victories. It all depended on how to play out, though. Insects are comparable to birds, and they are quite useful at the beginning of the journey. He realized that the point of emergence was at the eastern edge of the continent. He doesn't think a lot of battles are expected at the beginning of the game. Because of the enrichment strategy in the early stage of the game, early aggression will not be easy to utilize. Nebula decided that in that case, the starting race should be those who eat insects, such as humanoid frogs. But he is concerned about the number of tribes, there are about 500 of them. It is difficult for him to choose the right tribe to start the game. In the Lost World, the player's influence on creatures is directly related to their level of faith. Ten faith isn't enough for him to get those frogs to do anything. Wondering what other tribes were around, he saw humanoid lizards. They too feed on insects, and are able to survive without water. Nebula realized that it looked like they had separated from the main group, which was just to his advantage. As it turned out there were wounded and old men in this race. One of the specimens was even seriously injured. It looks like he used to be in the core group, but was driven out by a power struggle. The more he feels that the whole world has abandoned him, the harder it is for him to live. He thinks that in this case, it will be easier for him to find God by getting a small miracle. Nebula considers him such a fragile creature that he decided to start with him. The group of humanoid lizards continued their journey through the desert. Because of the intensely scorching sun, their faces showed great exhaustion. But suddenly, a wounded gazelle appeared before their eyes, they couldn't believe it was real. Since they hadn't eaten meat in a long time, everyone rushed sharply in her direction. The wounded and old men watching from the sidelines realized that they were unlikely to get any meat. Only bones remained of the badly wounded gazelle, but one of the lizards said there was still food left. There's still marrow in that pile of bones, it's very nutritious. As soon as he tried to eat one of the bones, one of his companions took it from his hands. The lizard said they'd had enough, we should leave it to those who can't hunt. Gathering all the bones into a pile, she took them to the old men and the wounded. A drop of happiness appeared on their faces. The healthy lizards asked Jail, did she really want to help them that badly? Old or young, but that wounded guy, he's going to die soon, his wound is already festering. I mean, he should have been dead a long time ago. It's a wonder he's still standing. Of course many of them survived because Rakrak took the brunt of the saber-toothed tiger. And it's certainly to be appreciated, but he's going to die soon anyway, and the living need food. Jail asked how are they not ashamed to say such things, 
he was the one who saved them. Once night fell, the humanoid lizards decided to take a break for a nap. Rakrak -rak lay all alone near the others. The throbbing of the wound made him ache with pain. Suddenly opening his eyes, he saw a butterfly fluttering right above his face. As he lifted himself up, the humanoid lizard saw that it was as if she was pointing him toward the top of the mountain. Rakrak's comrades saw that he had finally decided to proudly leave their pack. They decided to do nothing and silently watched everything that was going on. As he climbed higher and higher, Rakrak -rak wondered if this was all a crazy fantasy. It struck him as odd that he was the only one who had noticed her, and maybe that meant something. He wondered what it could be. He kept hoping that it wasn't all for nothing. Rakrak -rak saw a huge pile of bugs and realized it was enough food for his entire group. Nebula said that the humanoid lizard finally beheld a miracle, thanks to the intervention of a god. Watching them devour the donated food, he thought that this amount should be enough for several days. Suddenly he saw that Rakrak -rak decided to tell his kin about the miracle himself. After all, beings with high willpower can decide a lot of things on their own. The Rakrak -rak tribe recognized the divinity of the unnamed bug god. Nebula thought why a beetle god and not a butterfly god. He said no one gets a pretty name from the start. Rakrak -rak would be important to him from now on, but Nebula would become so to the lizard as well. The next day, Rakrak -rak saw that butterfly again. He wondered if he should follow it again. Looking at the guy, his companions thought about Rakrak -rak having a vision again, would he really go after him? He answered them that winter was near, and the bugs were still showing up from where the cold winds were blowing. If they keep going that way, there's a chance they'll all freeze to death. His comrade suggested ignoring the lead and going in the opposite direction. But Rakrak -rak doesn't think that's going to work either. Those lands are completely empty. He wondered what hidden meaning there was in his visions. He doesn't know it himself. But for now, the humanoid lizard has nothing else to do but follow them. Nebula realizes they have little faith, but there's nothing they can do about it in the beginning. To be more precise, he needs a lot more faith. But if Rakrak -rak believes in him, a better future awaited him than he could have ever dreamed of. Climbing to the very top of the mountain, Rakrak -rak shouted to his kin that the nameless bug god had brought them to the refuge. Everyone was delighted with what they saw and applauded Rakrak. -rak. It was not for nothing that they believed in him. If Rakrak -rak wants to know what Nebula wants from him, then let him be his priest. Let the humanoid lizard communicate his will to his people. The blessing will help him to do so. After eating enough and looking around at their surroundings, they decided to rest. In an instant, Firefly sat on his shoulder, which was wounded. As it turned out, this Firefly was Nebula's contact. He put Rakrak -rak into a deep sleep. Rakrak -rak didn't realize what was happening. Is he in a dream or is he imagining it? Seeing his likeness before him, the lizard asked who he was. Holding out his hand, Nebula asked if Rakrak -rak would take it. Not realizing who he was, the lizard asked fearfully what he really wanted. At the snap of Nebula's fingers, a mask appeared in the lizard's hands. Lifting the buffalo skull up, he put it on the nameless beetle god. When morning came, Rakrak -rak told his kin what he had dreamed during the night. They asked isn't God's will obvious? He just wants a buffalo sacrificed to him. But they realized that to catch the buffalo they would have to go far into the badlands, it was too dangerous. The others think jail is wrong, because the god who brought them there wants them there. He didn't want to put the tribe in danger. Jail replied that hunting the buffalo was a huge risk to life. The whole tribe would have to fight it to win. She thinks that if they do that, who will look after the old people and the wounded? Rakrak -rak replied that it sounded convincing, and that was why the lizard had decided to go hunting alone. Jail shouted that he couldn't catch the buffalo alone, it was almost impossible. Rakrak -rak said he wasn't going there to die. God gave him a blessing. They may find it hard to believe, but when he woke up, all of his wounds on his arm reached. Plus, his shoulder was covered in black scales, just like bugs. Jail admits it's weird, but that's no reason at all to go after the buffalo alone. Throwing his spear straight into a tree and splitting it in half, Rakrak -rak said let this be the occasion. His men were shocked, they didn't understand why he was still hiding such power from them. They realized that since he had recently died of his wounds, was it definitely their Rakrak? -rak? In an instant, the ground beneath their feet shook. As it turned out, it was a large herd of buffalo. Jail couldn't believe her eyes, 
she said it couldn't be. A herd of buffalo that was running along their regular route suddenly took and met them on their way. Rackrack, on the contrary, was happy about the event. He said there was no point in thinking about it. Jumping off the cliff the lizard shouted that it was time to get rid of his hunger. Rackrack threw his powerful spear, hitting the buffalo squarely in the forehead. Seeing this, the others got excited and decided to support their kin by taking out their guns. Rackrack realized that the god was sending them not only bugs, but the meat itself. Day turned to night again. After a hearty dinner, the lizards created an altar for sacrifice. Kneeling down, Rackrack asked the nameless bug god to accept their sacrifice, no matter how pathetic it was. The others similarly bowed their heads and prayed to the god to accept their offering. Watching this, Nebula thought that although the ritual itself was carelessly performed, it was the sincerity of their intentions that mattered. He received even more faith than he had bargained for at the beginning of his journey. It wasn't a bad rite for a novice priest, considering the time it took to complete it, it was pretty good. Nebula had a hard time attracting buffaloes because he is not a god of grass eaten by parno-hoofed animals. He had to use completely different methods to accomplish this. He wondered, could they really even eat a small buffalo cub? After that I realized that at this stage of development it is foolish to expect them to know cattle breeding, it is too early for that. Nebula realized that their tribe was small for this oasis. They would be there for a few years at most. At this point they know nothing about crop and livestock production. It will be problematic to survive this stage. He realized that knowledge and skills were quite difficult to discover on his own. And you can't speak directly either, or you'll be breaking the rules of the game. You can always find a way, but it will take time. Nebula decided to start with just one blessing. He thought it would be enough to start. Jail saw that Rakrak was already awake then told her that he had been watching the altar. The humanoid lizard said he had another dream last night. Jail asked if the god was trying to tell them something again. He answered that he was not sure, for he could not explain. In the dream, the altar shook strangely. There were no more fish in the pond that had protected them for years, and the ground itself had dried up so much that nothing else grew there. Jail told him that it hadn't happened yet. Rakrak said he knew. The boy added that then there was no point in worrying now, for God would take care of them. Rakrak believes in him too, but he realized that any will of God, often come side by side with hardship. If they could not understand his intent, it would be tantamount to betrayal. That's what he's afraid of. Once at the top of the throne, Rakrak saw something, then asked his friend to come up. Staring off into the distance, Jail now realized why the altar was wobbling. It was they who had driven them from the tribe. Jail asked did they come straight there? Rakrak replied that it was to be expected. Same blue scales as theirs before. They saw that guy was huge. Besides, the guys didn't understand why they were riding such a monster. Rakrak said that judging by their numbers, the entire tribe was on the move. Jail realized that from the looks of it, their homeland, the green swamps, had been completely depleted. She suggested that perhaps the god had taken all the fertile land. Rakrak replied that he did not know that. They thought their oasis was in a hollow in the mountain, hard to see unless you climb the mountain. It's also been suggested that in that case, that whole group might just pass on by. One of the lizards dared to shout that this place belonged to the nameless bug god. He made it clear that the blue scale tribe didn't belong there, let them leave. Holding their heads, Rakrak and Jail remembered that Yura's squad was patrolling today. Rakrak told him not to worry, maybe that was God's plan. As soon as he grabbed the spear in his hands, Jail asked did he really think the god himself had created such a situation? Rakrak replied that it might not be a test at all, but their mission. A mission to embrace and rescue those who were once their tribesmen. Jail replied that even so, that guy, if he was capable of gaining something spiritual, then he certainly wouldn't insist on kicking out all the weaker members of the tribe. Seeing the butterfly above him, Rakrak now realized for sure that he was not mistaken, this was God's will. It was at that moment that he realized he would do everything in his power. Watching him, Nebula said that Rakrak, understood everything exactly as he had intended earlier. These two tribes must unite. All for the sake of increasing the number of believers and technological development. It seemed strange to him that Rakrak himself had made this decision. There seemed to be his high willpower involved there, her number was 14. Nebula wondered, did the guy really think the appearance of the blue scale tribe was his doing? He's partly right, 
a leader with high willpower. This is clearly going to be a very good thing. If you impose a strong faith on them, he will no longer have to make all the decisions himself. Then, they would definitely be able to follow all of his orders much more effectively. The chief of the Blue Scale tribe shouted what are they doing there, are they really living? From Yura's patrol squad, a guy yelled that this was their land. The fat chief, grinning, asked what they had there. They replied that they did not need to know. Rakrak showed up and said they had trees and fertile land, booty, and most importantly God. The leader of the Blue Scale tribe wondered, what god? Rakrak replied that this place belonged to an unnamed bug god. He said he didn't understand what he was saying either. But that doesn't mean anything, let them go. Let them leave nicely. If they leave now, the chief won't attack them. He doesn't know how many of them are out there, but they certainly can't handle his huge army. The tribal leader said that since time immemorial a leader has needed to know how to count, didn't he? Pointing his spear in his direction, Rakrak replied that he didn't want to fight him. Unhappy and destitute, all of them can always find shelter in God's arms. And that's when God himself could take care of them. But all he heard in response was a loud laugh. The chief asked if he could not count after all. Rakrak replied that if he thought so, then he did not know God. Saying that it was only nonsense, the leader of the Blue Scale tribe shouted for him to die. Rakrak prayed to the Lord and asked that he be gifted with courage and strength to face the enemy. He gripped his spear tighter and went into battle, hoping to appease their leader. However, the huge reptile broke his spear with its powerful paw strike. Rakrak froze in place in confusion as to what he should do next. But suddenly, Nebula received a systematic notification that two different tribes had clashed. He realized that he now had the race of humanoid lizards at his disposal and could unlock a new skill for them. Thanks to that, Rakrak was able to fend off the strike of that huge reptile. Nebula seems to have taken full control of Rakrak's body now. The leader of the Blue Scale tribe couldn't understand how he dodged, but he realized that this couldn't happen anymore. Seeing all the characteristics of the chief, Nebula realized that Rakrak could have handled him alone. But the problem there wasn't him at all, it was the man and monster under their control. Rakrak's combat stats now far exceeded the others. They were no longer a problem for him. The God Avatar skill gives the user an additional characteristic called Divinity. One unit of it is equal to the maximum possible strength of the creature under your control multiplied by 200. His power is now 630. Grabbing Manon by the head, Rakrak without much effort was able to bring him to the ground. This overwhelming difference in strength made absolutely everyone numb. The chief lay beneath his monster and could not understand how this could have happened. Grabbing his dagger in his hands, he rushed towards Rakrak, saying that he should not be distracted in fighting him. There are never any mistakes in his calculations, but only he himself believed that. Before he could inflict a wound, Rakrak struck his face with his sharp claws. The chieftain fell to his knees. Glancing at the rest of his wards, Rakrak asked who was next. Laying their weapons on the ground, the Blue Scale tribe bowed to him and swore allegiance. Rakrak couldn't believe it was over. The Lord was in control of his body, he was as if in a dream. After dark, the two tribes gathered at the Divine Altar. One of the Blue Scale tribe asked, were they really banished to the wastelands from their tribe? But he wondered, then why are their scales black in color? He said that was the point. Told that through the worship of an unnamed bug god, they had changed and become stronger. If they couldn't find their god, they otherwise fell in the wastelands. He replied that the power of their god is so immense. Doesn't he really understand what happened today? Jail asked, could there be a lizard with such great power? She couldn't have imagined it. Then she asked Rakrak if it would be all right. He didn't immediately understand what his friend was talking about. Jail replied that with their arrival, there were six times as many of them. This place is going to run out very quickly. Suddenly, Rakrak said they'd have to get out of there. They can't just wander the wastelands in an endless search. Maybe because the answer lies somewhere in those lands? After all, God's clue was the appearance of their longtime brothers. Pointing their spears towards Manon, the boys shouted for him to calm down, his master was gone. They didn't understand why he couldn't just calm down. At that moment, Manon hit one of them with his tail. All their efforts were in vain, it seemed to them that at this rate he would break free and run away. One of the lizards asked, did Manon really want to be punished? Suddenly someone put a hand on his shoulder. It was Rakrak, 
but as soon as the monster saw him, it immediately roared. As he came closer, he held out some earthy root to Manon and offered him something to eat. Smelling what was in Rakrak's hand, Manon cautiously began to eat. Stroking his muzzle, the boy asked if he wanted more. But he'd have to be quieter for that. After giving him some more food, Rakrak said that the god must have a plan for him if he was still alive. Seeing that the beast was asking for more food, Rakrak said no. If Manon wanted to be on his side, he should learn patience. As he left, he told the boys that if Manon got cranky again, have them notify him. Examining the dagger in his hands, Rakrak asked if he could do something like that. The lizard replied that you could say that. And if it weren't for that guy's stubbornness, he would have been crafting much better weapons long ago. Rakrak immediately asked what this had to do with each other. He replied that it was all about the trees. They use a lot of wood while making weapons. The chief asked if it was for campfires, they burn wood to get a special hot material out of it. Rakrak replied that he understood, would definitely think about his idea and make a decision tomorrow. At that moment an armless lizard came up to him and said that he had heard Rakrak was looking for someone to accompany him into the wastelands. The chief replied that he thought he was the traveler. The lizard replied that yes, he was. A simple body, wandering around looking for shelter. As he wandered, he learned to find his way. About the lands that will free them from starvation, the guy has a couple in mind. Of course, he can't say for sure if other wanderers haven't already occupied them. Rakrak asked the other wanderers. So those places could have been found by someone else already? It's basically fine, if they go up against them, they just need to defeat them and take the lands for themselves. The lizard replied that if the boys were determined enough, he could trust them. Rakrak asked what about himself, how could he earn his trust? Pointing his finger to the sky, he replied that his answer would be there. It's not just the sky. The chief asked if it was the stars. The lizard replied that it was. At some point Rakrak realized that they were moving. The boy replied that that was right, they were in some kind of motion. He told me that he had found his own rules. If you know which way the stars go, you can find your way anywhere. Now he would tell about them, and if after observation everything came together, the lizard would earn his trust? The chief replied that of course. After a long story, he said they would see each other at the same time, in the same place. Seeing you're behind him, Rakrak asked him had something happened, or had Manon given him trouble again? The lizard said no. He was a little unhappy, but as soon as he got his food on time, he became much gentler. you mentioned what Jail had said, they'd have to find a way to navigate the wasteland without risking starvation. He began to tell that today, when Rakrak was able to appease Manon, who was enjoying the food, he suddenly got an idea. Maybe it's fashionable to do that not only with him, but with other animals as well? Rakrak didn't immediately understand what Yur was talking about. At that moment, he pointed at a herd of bulls. The system notified that Rakrak Flame had opened a new skill of cattle breeding. It is said that at a certain point, human history had two branches. Some started crop farming, while others devoted themselves to cattle breeding. Nebula realized that this was even to be mentioned in the game itself, however, crop production is more stable. It is not for nothing that most civilizations start their development near large bodies of water. However, the tribe he chose is made up of humanoid lizards. They are physically strong and adaptable to their environment. It is cattle breeding that they need the most strength. Plus, this tribe has developed a knowledge that will elevate them, which is or processing. They have finally learned how to give the metal the shape they want. Of course, it is still much softer than good bronze products. But for the Rakrak tribe, who had to fight with stone tools, this is already a big step forward. On top of that, they received another rather unexpected gift. It's astronomy. Of course, their knowledge so far can be called astronomy with a big stretch. But in the distant future, Nebula hopes they can use them properly. Looking up at the clear sky, Rakrak realized that just as the Wanderer had said, the stars guided the heavens. So now all he has to do is put the plan into action. Gathering all the people of the valley at the altar, Ranran said that he had an important announcement to make. The chief said that it had been a long time since the god had brought them to these lands. They even got to meet their brothers. And they could have abandoned them just as they had once abandoned them. They could have chosen a solitary life, and then they could have lived further on this earth. And those they would leave behind would perish among the vast wastelands. But that would be wrong. 
What God was doing was salvation, not rejection. Because that would be their greatest good, Rakrak told everyone that they would leave this land at dawn. Then he asked the traveler to come to him. He told me that this lizard had spent several days initiating him into the mysteries of star chart travel. Rakrak has personally verified that he speaks the truth. The traveler will lead them forward. From now on, they'll trust him to guide them on their way. And let everyone know, so he can tell the others where they're going. The traveler began to tell that when the morning sun rises, they will go to the right of the place where it rises. For ten days they will go forward. Then, turning right along the rotten river, they will walk for fifteen more moons, and three more days along the mountain rift. After this journey, they will reach the goal, the endless forest. There will be many wild animals and tribes of other creatures there. Rakrak added that it meant the place was perfect for them. Thanking the wanderer, Rakrak said he could go. The lizard replied that it was nothing. Turning to Yur, Rakrak asked him why they had not eaten any of the buffalo they had caught yesterday. Yur replied that they just weren't that hungry. Rakrak asked and what of it? Everyone worked so gloriously hard to catch every buffalo, but the prey never became food. Yur replied that he agreed, everyone had worked hard, but he hadn't eaten anything because he wasn't really hungry. If he put up with it now, he could eat later when he acted hungry and he decided so. Rakrak shouted that he had done well. Yur wanted to eat the buffalo now, but held back for the sake of his future. That's excellent, isn't it, will the lizard continue in the same vein? Yur said yes, definitely. Until he's completely starved, he'll follow that rule. Rakrak said that's fine, thinks the chief should reward him for it. It was an iron-tipped spear. As soon as the lizard took the spear in his hands, Rakrak said that the others who had listened to Yurs committing, they were worthy of such a spear as well. As she watched, Jael thought she wondered what his plan was. Now she seemed to understand. Taking one of the buffalo skulls, the chief ordered everyone to approach it one at a time. Calling them true warriors, he said let God's help be with each one. Their journey will only be successful if they are patient and maintain the same restraint they have shown. Putting a buffalo skull on the ear lizard, Rakrak said his name would now be Bone Warrior. At dawn, they all gathered in columns. Rakrak said it was time to leave this divine place. But let everyone remember, God's will is with them. That is why they are not bound to any place. Rakrak shouted for absolutely everyone to let the nameless bug god into their head. The chief can't promise it will be easy. But he invites them to go forward fearlessly. Just as they dealt with the urge to eat buffalo, they will deal with this road as well. It's for their own good. Let everyone gather all their will in their fist and go. The unnamed bug god will always be with them. Rakrak has arbitrarily expressed the will of God. He asks to be presented with a gift of forgiveness for such an act. Nebula replied that there was no need to apologize. If he had done otherwise, he would not have been chosen as his priest. Since he had reached the height of his allies, things had been going very well. Plus, those very special skills of Rakrak finally showed themselves. He is doing a great job and meeting all of Nebula's expectations. Rakrak has made a new beginning. They set out on the road. The journey was hard for them for they had all refused food and were walking under the scorching sun. Manon was the first to give up with a pitiful groan. He collapsed to the ground in exhaustion. As he approached him, Rakrak said it was too early to fall. The traveler replied that he seemed tired. Looking at him, the chief asked if they had time to rest. The traveler replied that there was no other choice, they had to rest. Rakrak ordered everyone to stop, saying that it was time to take a break. He wondered, if they reached the end of the mountain ranges, would they find what they were looking for? There was only the unknown ahead, it would be worth a break. As it turned out, they had been walking at a steady pace for more than three days. He realized that the group was tired and running out of food. Rakrak realized that he could only hope for a miracle from God. Suddenly, one of the lizards told the chief about the appearance of another tribe that was coming at them. Org shouted that it's great, now there's definitely no one blocking their way. They must get away from there as fast as possible, nothing could be worse than that monster. When Rakrak saw them, he said they were really crazy. Maybe they're just fools, though. Upon seeing the leader, the org immediately threw their weapons out of their hands, kneeled down, and begged his forgiveness. They told me that there seemed to be a misunderstanding, 
because they just wanted to get out of this canyon as soon as possible. The orgs were in a hurry, for they had fled their homes. Thinking of their relatives poisoned in the wastelands, they just wanted to eat. Looking at them, Rakrak asked why they were running then. What had happened in the wastelands? Org asked if they had seen that hill, and then pointed with his hand. He said that they used to live there. The land here is hardly fertile, but they had enough until the monster appeared. Observing what was happening, Nebula asked the monster. It must be a deadly abomination. It was an ancient Scalapendra. The description of the Lost World says that they were created by the missing gods of the past. But even after the hosts disappeared, this huge abomination remained on the ground. As it turned out, this abomination's special skill was its poisonous fangs. Nebula realized that it was too strong an opponent for them for now, after which he continued to watch. Suddenly, the lizards realized that the ground beneath them began to shake. Org replied that it was just a monster roaring. The lizards looked at Rakrak and asked what they would do next. The chief asked the traveler how long it would take to go around the mountain. He replied that if you went around the mountain, it would take about eight days. Nebula understood Rakrak's hesitation, but he too could be understood in such a situation. He doesn't know what he should do. Now all his tribesmen are scared. Going around is a very wise decision, but what will the chief do? Jail went to the chief and said they should fight. They have the advantage now. She told the chief that their artisan was using a method that accelerated the melting of metals. Does Rakrak remember how he does it? The chief replied that he used a special tool. Jail said exactly what it is. It's called the air mech method. It requires less effort than all the other methods. Rakrak said what does that mean, if they use it too, they can get more power with less effort. However, the artisan experimented for a long time before creating such a thing. Jail replied that they didn't need anything special, a simple instrument would do. The first thing that came to Jail's mind to get rid of the abomination was to prop up the rocks with sticks and drop them on the monster. With their combined efforts, they pushed rocks to destroy the monster below. Nebula said that rolling over rocks to crush the Scalapendra is a simple but good idea. But he believes that to kill such a centipede you have to drop all the rocks at once. He didn't know if it was possible to accomplish this. Jail ordered everyone to push faster. Suddenly, the stone began to fall sharply. Jail asked, did it really work? Looking down, hoping they had made it, they were in for a huge upset. The lizards realized that the rocks did not harm the Scalapendra in any way, but only made it angry. They saw it rising rapidly toward them and decided to dump the rest of the rocks faster. At that moment, Nebula realized it was too late. He decided to reincarnate into Rakrak's body. The lizard grabbed one of the rocks, trying to throw it down directly at the Scalapendra. Rakrak shouted for them to move rocks, they just need to help him out a little. The chief realized that this monster was unlikely to stand still, so he grabbed his spear and jumped off the cliff. During his leap, he hurled his spear straight at the Scalapendra, piercing its body. The rocks continued to fall right on top of her, doing massive damage. Rakrak was the first to land on the ground, followed by the body of a Scalapendra falling right in front of him. Nebula said it was very good, for the hunt was a success. He realized that his faith in him was growing, but he got something more important than that. It was a new subject. Nebula wanted to kill the abomination just for that, the essence of abomination. Every god has resources, though they can be obtained through faith, special items are used to create a whole new thing. With this essence, O will be able to summon the essence. It is a faith generator that spreads the word about God. In addition, an entity can evolve. If developed enough, it can gain a class like Apostle or Avatar. Nebula wondered, was creating an entity there the same as in the game? Then, what should he create? Jail wondered if it was possible to eat the meat of this beast. She broke one leg and decided to try it. After tasting it, she said it smelled a little stinky, but it was edible. It doesn't taste too bad, however, it would be difficult to eat it like that. Thinking about it, she decided that she could dilute the flavor with something else. For example, add the edible part of the woody vine and cook the meat on the fire. Then there is a chance of overpowering that bad smell, the leaves will add flavor. Rakrak tasted it and froze. His taste bud sensed something new. He said that the meat became soft and quite tasty. 
Jail replied that she had tried to cook it. She just added edible greens and fried it up and this is what came out. Rakrak said the smell was so bad he was about to throw all the meat away. Cooking is a good skill. Could Jail teach him that skill? She replied that of course. Jail remembered that the leader of the orc tribe had an heir of his own, and thinks Rakrak will need an heir soon too, he's getting old after all. It is very necessary for stability in the tribe, let him think about it. Rakrak asked, did she seriously think he needed to find a partner? Jail replied that if he doesn't see anyone else in that role yet, how about her? Rakrak wondered if Jail was right. It was worth doing something about it. Suddenly he noticed something behind Jail in the pile of rocks glinting. It looked like it was inside the rock on the monster's back. Yer tasted it, and said it was not edible. The traveler replied that it was metal, namely gold. Jail had seen it before, as the artisan had shown her different types of metals. If cleaned well it will reflect light perfectly and shine beautifully. And they say gold doesn't change color or rot over time. She believes this is the reason it is valued more than other metals. You're said it's pretty soft, but it's heavy. And it's not good for food. The traveler asked if he wanted to hunt deer then. Its meat is sweet and very tasty. The orcs told the wanderer where he could hunt deer. Joyful Yur asked the chief if he would go with them. He said they could go on their own for the time being. He wondered why this metal didn't rot. What's wrong with it? Everything dies, decays and disappears. Nothing in this world stays the same. Not this gold plaque, though. Whoever made it was trying to keep something on it. Jail came in to notify the chief. She said that the tribe was ready for bed. Rakrak said he hadn't told anyone where he was going. Good thing she always manages to find him. Jail replied that it wasn't hard, he was the only lizard wearing a fur cape. Rakrak said she was the one who told him to wear it. She did, for he is a chief, and so she wanted to make him special. She believes a tribal leader should have a symbol of sorts. Darkness fell, and Rakrak still pondered. Life goes hand in hand with death. This metal, too, would vaporize someday. Suddenly before his eyes, the fireflies lined up in a strange pattern, as if they wanted to communicate something to him. Rakrak didn't realize what was happening. Was this an illusion or his fantasy? However, their movements remind him of the markings from this stone tablet. Looks like the chief realized something, it's not just gold that doesn't rust, it's what it shows that matters. He decided to share this with Jail. She asked the chief if there were any problems. Rakrak replied that it was fine, he had something he wanted to show her. Drawing the first symbol, Jail asked, is it kind of like him? The chief said it was a male lizard. Jail asked him to explain it to her. He drew a second symbol and said it was her. So is it a woman or is it a female lizard? Rakrak replied that it was correct. The chief drew an equal sign in the middle. Jail immediately asked what it meant. He said that means they become partners. And that's his response to her proposal. Looks like our favorite lizard has finally found his life partner. The system notified Nebel that the Rakrak tribe had invented writing. That's great news, he said. It will of course take several generations to create a sustainable written language. But he's happy that it happened almost at the very beginning of the game. Now it's time to enjoy the festival. At first glance, it may seem like a simple hunt, but competing to get the biggest game for their partner is the humanoid lizard's way of celebrating a wedding, and they both seem to have done an excellent job. Is that a coincidence or not? Rakrak himself is likely shocked by Jail's abilities. Rakrak said they would have to face this monster sooner or later anyway, and that's why he thinks the orcs can continue to live here as they used to. The orc chieftain thanked Rakrak. This is great news for his people. The orc introduced them to his son. He said he was the future leader of the tribe. They are more familiar with the area and their son can lead further. They used to live in the forests until they were driven out by huge beasts and other tribes. But thanks to them, they were able to restore their way of life. The orcs will never forget their kindness. On their way they noticed huge footprints of some strange creatures. Rakrak asked the wanderer if the footprints were familiar to him. He said that yes, he knew who it was. These are frog tracks, they move on two legs, humanoid frogs. There are both peaceful and warlike species among them. They speak and think as they do. The chief said that since the frogs were out scouting, they were at war with someone right now. And the footprints show that there was not one, 
but probably five members of their species. He thinks the frogs outnumber them and thinks they should all go back to their temporary camp. Rakrak ordered the tents to be pitched farther out, let them take up as much space as possible. The others were at a loss as to why this was necessary. Jail said the other tribes, bigger than them. She feels more scouts should be sent to the borders. The chief confirmed that they would do so, but have him make sure everyone gets an equal share of the work. With so much light, the other tribes would definitely be watching them. A few days later, they changed locations. Fortunately, the collision with the frogs never happened. In such a short period of time, they had well consolidated the security of the tribe. Nebula questions whether there are any players at the moment who have been able to make the same progress. Cattle ranching is progressing quite nicely. And the tribe has adapted the house to the new environment. It's amazing how quickly they were able to spread literacy within the tribe. The symbols on the stone were visible to all the lizards, and a simple map was carved with the designation of hunting grounds. Rakrak also began recording the amount each lizard had harvested. It made them realize that they had to work harder to collect more. Their productivity increased many times over. Locust swarms in the center of the continent are gradually increasing, and insect numbers have generally increased in the north. The insect race had reached level 4. If there were other players around him, Nebula wouldn't have been able to dream of such a thing. But since he was summoned from the eastern lands, maybe it's time to take another advantage out of the circumstances? Both Rakrak's abilities and the tribe's development had already reached average. However, this is only the beginning, further ahead they will face dangers they have not yet encountered. Suddenly someone from the guard shouted to the chief that they were in big trouble. A tribe of humanoid frogs is heading straight for them, they won't get away in time. The boys decided to meet them themselves. So that's what they are, Rakrak thought. But suddenly, he noticed a lizard among them. Or maybe they wanted to negotiate? The commander of the frogs decided to introduce himself. His name is Shunan, he is the son of the great chief Alroy. They can relax, they're not going to attack them. Rakrak also introduced himself. He said he was the chief of this tribe and also did not wish to fight them. He asked why they had decided to honor them with such a visit. Shunan replied that they had come to report that a tribe of lizards had settled in their territory. However, the Rakrak do not think that all this land belongs to them. They did not see any marking of their boundaries. The chief admits that they didn't even bother to look for them. And he apologizes for this misunderstanding. But he also asks for understanding, that such rules are different from those in their homeland, which is in very distant lands. Therefore, can they let them stay here while they find a better place? It seemed to Rakrak that Shunan was the most worthy one here, and so he decided that he could make such a request of him. Shunan replied that he was right. With his authority as the future leader, it was quite feasible. Rakrak assumed that the chieftain had sent them to take a closer look at them. Of course he still had a lot of questions for them. You have to be careful and unobtrusively find out as much as possible. He offered to walk to the village where they could accept their hospitality with full heart. Since their tribes had agreed to peace, they should celebrate immediately. Shaunan smiled and said he didn't think it was the best idea. Thanking him for the invitation, he said he couldn't accept it. Their tribes were not yet so familiar. Rakrak replied that he could not simply let go of those to whom their people were indebted, and suggested we celebrate it right here. Shaunan replied that it was probably okay to do that. Now, he must Rakrak must understand the relationship between that lizard and the frogs, and why they came to them really. But you can't show them that he's interested. If they realize what he's thinking, they'll try to use it against them. Rakrak decided to ask Shaunan what were those big feathers around his neck. He replied that they were the feathers of cockatrices. They are dangerous animals that live around this forest. Huge birds, standing on two legs. Looks like Rakrak hasn't met them yet. Not only are they big, but they are also poisonous and very difficult to catch. In addition to their speed, they are known for their agility. They are the reason they have to keep an eye on the area. Rakrak asked, since they are so hard to catch, does that mean they attack them from a distance with a spear throw? Shunan was surprised to hear this since he doesn't know what spears are. He decided to show off his weapons. He shouted to his servants to bring him a bow and arrow. Since everyone was busy, Shunan ordered that Owen bring him arrows and a bow. Also asked him to hang a target on a tree so he could practice shooting. Shunan hit the target accurately the first time. 
Rakrak marveled at his skill. Shunan told them that they had been learning to shoot since they were children. He didn't want to brag, but he was considered one of the best archers in the tribe. Rakrak asked if he could try this bow. He replied that of course he could. It may seem difficult the first time. The stick and thread are very strong. The damage and area of effect is less than a spear, but you can carry a lot of arrows. In addition, arrows fly more accurately than spears, and you can shoot them more often. He would have liked to delve much more deeply into the study of this skill. Shaunan said that nothing comes out perfect the first time. He also ordered Owen to pick up the arrows. Rakrak was surprised, after all, he was the one doing the shooting, so he should have collected them himself. Shaunan said he should consider it a gesture of goodwill. There's something more important than shooting that he needs to learn. Collecting arrows Rakrak asked Owen, how did the lizard end up among the humanoid frogs? He panicked a bit and replied that they lived together in the same tribe. The chief asked why lizards and frogs were together. He said that the two races could help each other. Smiling Owen wished that they too would continue to live in harmony. Frogs can't leave the water for long. And lizards are good at picking fruit and climbing trees. Rakrak thinks sharing food with them for protection isn't a bad idea, but they can fend for themselves. Owen said the forest is a dangerous place and the Alroy tribe is the largest in the entire forest. Without them, he wouldn't have made it to this point, and wouldn't be socializing with him now. Rakrak told him to forget his words. Let him pretend he was just asking him about how to shoot a bow properly. Shaunan was already used to the taste of venison, but the addition of greens made this meat even tastier. Rakrak asked if he had tasted buffalo meat. The frog replied that yes, it had been a long time since they had caught them, but he remembered that their meat was delicious. The chief said they keep live buffalo in their possession. If Shaunan wants, they could trade one of those for a couple bows. He wished he could, but they could discuss it when they knew each other better. Fortunately, the other members of their tribe got along well with the lizards. Not only Owen was able to fit into their society, but so were the frogs. It was good that both races existed in their tribe, Shunan said. He asked Owen if he could tell him how they had been helping each other with tribal affairs for the past few months. Owen said of course. He would be glad to tell of the friendship of their peoples. Rakrak thought so, Shaunan had brought it all up like that as if they had talked it over beforehand. If he hadn't talked to Owen before, he might have fallen for it. Rakrak said he was glad to know them. And he offered to go to them himself next time, rather than trouble them with such a long trek here. Shunan replied that he didn't need to. This place is perfect for such meetings. As he left, Rakrak noticed something was wrong. This didn't seem like a relationship of equal species. Owen gets a slap on the wrist from Shaunan. Looks like he suspected something. Shaunan asked what the man had said to the lizard chief. Owen replied that he hadn't told him anything. Rakrak asked him how to shoot a bow properly, and he just gave him a few tips. Rock Frog said it was just an excuse. Owen can't even shoot a bow himself. The lizard replied that he told him what he knew how to do to ward off suspicion. And then Owen pretended he couldn't tell him everything he knew. And to teach him archery, he has to give Shaunan something in return. And what did the chief answer? asked the frog. Owen replied that he had given up on the idea. He said he was sorry he had nothing to offer him. Skunan says he didn't expect anything else from him. Frog knows Owen is a trickster. He asked if Owen remembered what was on that island. He was very lucky, let him think hard. Shunan wanted to offer these lizard children as a sacrifice. But the new victims found them themselves. Owen said the frog was right, he was very lucky. And he would try to outsmart them. If Owen had known it would turn out this way, he wouldn't have even tried to get here. He should have guessed everything when the frogs welcomed them so happily. Or when they brought them to the fraternity ceremony. Or at least when they told them to pack up and come to this island. The remaining 200 lizards could do nothing against the 1550,000 frogs. Plus, they have God on their side. It's a two-headed monster who commands frogs, exactly as they command them. It seems that will never change. You can't escape the inevitable. The leader of the lizard tribe with black scales looks like a strong warrior. And despite the tribe's 600 members, they're just simple savages who didn't even know bows and arrows existed. If he donates them to the frog god, he can live a lot longer.
let his son be patient a little longer. His father will soon convince these lizards to come to them and save him, whatever it takes. The next day, the tribe of frogs and lizards decided to make an exchange. Shunan was glad to see a real live buffalo. Rakrak, on the other hand, said they have them and thinks it's not a bad trade. Owen told Shunan that there was no need to rush. They should get to know each other better before exchanging resources. Besides, they don't know anything about their tribe yet. Wouldn't it be better to visit them first? Then they can give them a bow. Wouldn't that be a good opportunity to get to know each other better? Rakrak decided he didn't need to go to them yet. His tribe was able to recreate his bow and arrow. He asked Jail how it had worked out this time. She said that the arrow only reached half of the maximum distance. Rakrak said he didn't even aim. Apparently that's the limit, they replicated the look perfectly, but not the bowstring. Jail said their fifth meeting is coming up. They seem very eager to learn as much as they can about them. The chief thinks they're obviously hiding something behind this simple trust. Maybe they're trying to pull some kind of dirty scheme. The problem is that they still don't know their plans, so you have to stay on guard. It was time for him to accomplish something at this meeting. Rakrak asked if they had gathered all the herbs. Jail replied that everything was gathered, the herbalist found out where they grew. The chief thinks it would be good if Owen was the solution to their problem. Jail asked, why not give it a try? It's okay to give this guy a chance. Meanwhile, Owen was getting another round of abuse from his boss. Shunan ordered the big guy, oh boy, to leave him alone, or he might die like that. Owen said that these lizards are from the Black Scale tribe, they are more cautious than he thought. Obo thinks they're nothing like them. Jumping into a trap without thinking of the consequences, Shaunan said Owen needed to hurry. Father said to arrange a sacrifice ceremony for him as early as possible. Have him find out more information about them. They must get the chief of the tribe and all his warriors there as early as possible. Owen realized that only the frogs knew that. We have to listen to him carefully. Shunan said that the illness of the father and elders is only getting worse, it cannot be put off. Owen asked, does that mean that if they are sick, they are infected with scabies disease? Is it really that dangerous? Shaunan thinks the lizard men shouldn't know about it, but will tell him nonetheless. Scabies is a dangerous disease, if you get sick with this stuff, you'll not only start itching, but you'll be covered in white sticky mucus. No matter how much he washes it off, it never comes off. And over time, the mucus covers most of his body. When there's too much of it, you get breathing problems. And the next stage is death. This is the first time Owen has heard that scabies can be fatal. Strange that he could tell it to him. Maybe Shaunan, testing him, he should probably be neither happy nor surprised. The lizards must not find out about this. Otherwise, there will be individuals among them who will mock the frogs for it. Shaunan said he did, but they wouldn't be able to hide it forever. Owen thinks it's okay to tell the lizard tribe that they can get it too. Skunan said that's a good idea but because scabies doesn't apply to them. There's an herb in the woods that produces white sap when you break it. And even one that can cause scabies. Owen comes in contact with frogs most often and he can tell he contracted the infection from them. Shaunan thought so, this one could be brought to life by Owen's trickster. Great idea. If he can convince the lizards to come to them, his family will be forever free from the fate of victims. Owen thanked him for that. He almost peed his pants when he heard that. Shaunan said they would need a huge sacrifice this time. Let him try very hard to bring them. Owen thinks they'll have to give them a couple bows to negotiate after all. The Rakrak tribe brought an herb with which to treat scabies. The chief asked if even that wasn't enough to trade for a bow. Owen wondered if they had gathered all the grass in the area. Shunan replied that no, but it wasn't a matter of quantity. It's just that exchanging weapons requires a certain amount of trust between tribes. Rakrak said to build trust between their tribes, he wants Shunan to fulfill his one request. He would like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Owen. Shaunan replied that of course they could go. Owen said that before becoming part of the tribe their grey-brown lizards underwent a fraternization ceremony. Before that, they got to know the frogs better. Owen asked the chief to tell about himself. He, in turn, will also try to be as open to it as possible. Thinks they should suspend disbelief and take a step towards each other. Rakrak said he was right, distrust had formed between them. It must end.
the chief will tell him all about them. Shaunan said they did a good job. They have achieved outstanding results. He asked Owen if the lizards themselves had said they would come to their village. He replied that they had. Oh boy said that when they promised to show them their village, he thought it might be a trap, but that was just silly. Thanks to this, the frogs now know where their settlement is, as well as its size. And even learn the history of their disease. According to the scout, the tribe consisted of about 600 men. In fact, there were about 300 of them, but only 30 of them were warriors. Skunen didn't think they'd trust them that much. Owen had done a lot to make it happen. Let him tell him what he wants. Owen replied that he could only ask for what he had previously promised him. Shaunan said he didn't know what it was about. The lizard reminded him that if he did everything right, he'll take his son off the victim list and let them live together. Oh boy asked, did he really promise him that? Shaunan said not to be so harsh, his father would understand. Let Owen not worry, he remembered his promise. The lizard thanked his boss. Now it's gonna be just like he wanted it to be. Owen will be able to live with his baby. This is the mistake of a foolish tribal leader named Rakrak. He should have been more vigilant. That day, seeing these inscriptions on the ground, he asked Rakrak what they were. The latter said they call them letters. He and his allies had invented them. The cross means no, which means false. Owen asked if two letters could be written side by side. The chief said of course. If you write these letters side by side, you get not false, in other words, it also means true. Rakrak said he never thought about it. Owen is a genius. The first thing that came to his mind was how Shaunan had called him sly. Rakrak never talked about the letters in meetings, why did he tell him about it and not the frogs? He replied that it was all about trust. It was a trust that had formed between their tribe and the frogs of Alroy. But he doesn't really care about that so much as he cares about the trust between them. Owen said worth it, he's generally between lizards and frogs. The chief said he didn't believe his words about the frogs. Surely there must be a very different meaning behind them. His tribe knows what pain is, and they know what it's like to be lost and intimidated. They are just like him, and they know suffering by sight. Those words brought tears to Owen's eyes. The chief asked if Owen thought he was wrong. He said not at all. Is there anything else he wants to say? Rakrak said no, he had already noticed glimmers of faith in them. He was very cocky, but he can't handle all the frogs and their faith. Even bragged about catching a monster. It's useless for those who have already seen real monsters. They didn't even know how to use a bow much less the secret weapon of the frog warriors. Took telling him about the letters out of the blue was a pretty stupid decision. He thinks Rakrak shouldn't have trusted him so much. But why the hell did he believe him, since he's a simple trickster and deceiver? The next morning, the Black Scale tribe arrived at the frog village. Shaunan welcomed his guests with open arms. Rakrak thanked and said he hoped today's meeting would deepen their tribe's relationship. Let them not worry that they came with weapons. They were just worried they'd meet Cockatrice on the way. What idiots, Shaunan thought. They can't beat Cockatrice with those sticks and tips. When the feast starts, they'll get them drunk and shoot them with poisoned arrows. Rakrak asked where Owen was. Shaunan replied that he was preparing for the banquet. Looks like he's drawing something on the floor. Probably deciding where to put them all. Shaunan told them to go through there and say hello to him while he checked to see if the food was ready. After saying hello, Owen said he was marking their seats with letters. When they were seated, the feast would begin. This feast will initiate peace and friendship between their tribes. It's worth noticing the sign he's drawing. Putting on the mask Rakrak told Yur they were starting. Let them destroy all the frogs. After surveying the area the chief said it looked like they had killed everyone. Yur reported that while they were attacking the warriors, many frogs escaped. Along with them was Shunan, so they would soon face the arrows. He thinks everything is going according to plan, but they could use the arrows. After thinking for a moment Rakrak told Owen that he had a small favor to ask of him. Shaunan didn't understand how things had turned out this way. Had that damn Owen betrayed them, he ordered all the warriors of the village to raise their weapons and attack the lizards. Let their lizards stay in the village until the warriors get there. We must attack the enemy lines until reinforcements arrive. Have them attack when ready. Their arrowheads are soaked in poisonous frog venom. 
If they only touch it, they will experience terrible agony. Squad leader Yur ordered the troops to hide behind the metal plates. The frogs were certainly not prepared for this. They couldn't believe their eyes, the lizards had beaten back all their arrows. These plates could withstand spears, much less arrows. Yur said it was a good thing. Shaunan said he didn't care, let them keep shooting. We can't let them go any further. Suddenly he saw thick smoke in front of his eyes. Now you can't see them at all. That smoke will make their shots less accurate. Where did it come from? It was Owen who decided to set fire to the village. His friends asked him why he was doing it. Owen said, Are they going to use these batons instead of weapons? Lizard replied that they were given them on Shunan's orders. And it can't be that Shunan ordered them to burn down the village. Owen said no, it was a lizard from the Black Scale tribe who asked him for a favor. Let them trust him they'll beat the frogs. They can do the same with their sticks. But how are they going to do it? And how can they trust him, he's a liar. Owen replied that that's why they should believe him. Because he's a trickster Owen. After all, even he had risked everything he had, there was no turning back. Shunan was horrified to see his village ablaze with fire. The lizards from the village had betrayed them too. The advantage is now on the enemy's side. They must retreat immediately. The servant said they would kill their warriors. If he, as the direct heir to the chief, gets into danger, the whole tribe is finished. He does not doubt Oboy's fighting skills. However, there is a more reliable and effective way to get rid of these lizards. The commander asked, is Mr. Shunan fighting in the lower part of the village? The attendant said that was correct. There was a squad of warriors near the welcome feast site. They had sent five more to check what was going on. Apparently they're all dead by now. That leaves fifteen Shunan warriors. And four or five on the island. Ten more with him, and together with the warriors of the upper village, there were forty-five in all. The numerical advantage is still on their side. Have the warriors coat their arrows with poison. When Mr. Shunan arrives, they will immediately go into battle. Commander Oboy sensed someone approaching. Have them prepare to fire. He didn't understand where the feeling of excitement came from. A feeling just like when he'd met Cockatrice. His instincts told him there was danger ahead. When they see the shadow, they start shooting at him. It is a huge manon controlled by Jael and her mate. It has grown even stronger in these lands. A comrade asked, doesn't manon get hit by arrows? She replied that he just eats them. He always eats anything that flies near his mouth. He's been angry and violent lately. Let him watch carefully, there's a feast for him. After thinking for a moment, Oboy decided that maybe he should shoot him in the eye. This monster is no match for Cockatrice. It's much faster, and it can't aim for the eyes. So to poison it, they have to get the poison in its mouth. The commander ordered everyone to throw their frogs into its mouth. The beast has no defense against poison it will eat anything they throw at it. The boys didn't understand why they were throwing their frogs from their bags into Manon's mouth. In some strange way, why are they giving up their guns? Jail said that if they wanted to poison Manon, they should have known that the scheme was a failure from the start. The system notified that the black scale lizards had received a blessing. The first was strong skin, the second was great strength, and the third was resistance to poisoning. Meanwhile, one of the warriors almost shot the chief. Yur managed to deflect the arrow with his spear. The commander thinks it was the last warrior. Shunan must have abandoned his tribe and fled. But thanks to that, the grey-brown lizards started attacking the frogs. So that's it, it worked out pretty well. Rakrak says they have no right to condemn them for it. There's only one thing he doesn't understand. Despite all the tribe's problems their great chief Alroy never showed up. Watching them closely, Nebula said that it was already because of him. The disease called ACO-023731 has a fungal appearance. It infects the mucous membranes of amphibians. It is extremely contagious with a long incubation period. It was quite difficult for Nebel to find it. Importantly, it infects the mucous membranes of amphibians and is deadly. This was around the time that Rakrak decided to leave the Holy Land. Hundreds of kilometers away, he found the disease. And was able to bring it to a remote lake. Thanks to countless wasps and other insects, 
it worked out just right. And then Alroy, the strong chief of the humanoid frog tribe, suddenly disappeared. Even attempting sacrifices for healing did not help him in any way. He asked their two-headed god to accept his offering and show these lizards the power of his god. At that time, Shunan and his men had just arrived. He was surprised that his father had already started the ritual, and that they would win. Rakrak saw Owen and said he did a great job. But what's the rush? He replied that they should go to an island in the middle of the lake. The lizard children are there, the frogs are going to sacrifice them. The god could not heal the lizards, however, he will try to attack Rakrak's tribe. His warriors may not have the strength to win. The chief said he should have told him about it sooner. They had already left in the boats, they would not get to the island. Owen suggested swimming, they could. Rakrak said it was too dangerous. When they get to shore, they're defenseless against the bows. And they can start shooting even when they're in the water. Owen got on his knees and started begging, because his son was there. He's to be sacrificed. Rakrak got angry and slapped him. He should have said so a long time ago. Why didn't Owen trust him sooner? The chief doesn't believe in the god of those damn frogs. He is confident that they will defeat him with their strength. Even if this god were to come out at him right now, he would show the strength to defeat him. But for the good of his own child, why didn't Aun say so sooner? It would have made all the difference if Rakrak had known of Shunan's intentions a little earlier. The two-headed lord of frogs has appeared. Chief Alroy praises his god. Let him accept his offering. They dare to disturb the lake of the lord. Let him punish these black lizards. Punish them all with his might. Rakrak thought it was too late, he was too late. But maybe it's still worth a try. They won't have an advantage this time, so no amount of subterfuge will help. And there may be casualties in their ranks. It looks like there are no other options. Suddenly, the very butterfly nebula flew by Rakrak's side. The chief asked Owen if he believed in miracles. Shunan was surprised at the reaction of the two-headed god. He usually accepted their offerings with delight. Something darkened abruptly, looking back he saw a huge praying mantis. Looks like it was Nebula who recreated it. A minor race of level 4, minimal divinity and faith, and also the essence of abomination. When all these conditions were met, he succeeded in creating this creature. At this point, you will probably find very few players who have made the same progress. And a great battle began between the two-headed god and the mantis. The frogs escaped as best they could. Chief Alroy almost died in the scuffle. But he still believes his god can win. Mantis said he was just a water serpent who had put on the guise of a deity. He should have realized by now how insignificant he is. The Mantis will present him to his maker, and help you atone for your guilt. The guilt of his sinful folly. He will atone for his sins with flesh and blood. The two-headed monster, a level 4 serpent and a level 3 Hyungsun, was defeated. A mantis named Stratus, now a level 11 creature. His skill is great strength. The Rakrak tribe had won the victory, everyone was ecstatic at what they had seen. Owen sobbed with happiness. Nebula was surprised that this monster looked quite strong, but it was still far from his creature. The skill, tremendous strength, randomly assigned to Stratus is pretty good, but he's sure a weak enemy hasn't unlocked its full potential. The system notified him that he killed the two-headed monster. And he gets the essence of the evil spirit, and a new habitat. Looks like he got very lucky. A habitat called seawater was discovered. That's why the two-headed serpent couldn't use its power. It's because the water in the lake is fresh. A habitat in the river would be nice, but they don't really need it now. It might come in handy someday, so we'll put it aside for now. The remaining frogs were trying to get away from the place as fast as they could. Alroy couldn't understand how this could have happened. Shunan realized that it wasn't the scabies that made his father weak. It was because of the power of the two-headed monster. He was so enchanted by her. From the moment God appeared, his father relied on him for everything. All the warriors hid behind the god, and he in turn became a coward who can't come forward. Mantis Stratus told the creator that his will was done. Nebula replied that good job, now it can rest until the next time. When the time comes, he will again submit to the will of the creator. Will Rakrak stop there? After all, 
the frog leader Alroy is still alive. He said the frogs are on a boat headed for the upper village. Since the island is empty, they will just swim across. They will win an unqualified victory today. Is there a lizard here that could lead them to the top of the frog village? Owen replied that he would go, he needed to go to the island to see his son anyway. And he wasn't tired yet, so he could do it. One of the brown-scaled lizards asked to be allowed to help the Rakrak tribe as well. The chief replied that they were not warriors and would not be able to fight with such wounds. The lizard said that he was a warrior and not only warriors are able to kill frogs. It may not be very honorable, but they all came here to kill frogs indiscriminately. The way their tribe was able to fight back inspired everyone to keep fighting. This fire had been growing in their hearts since the time when they first became slaves. Rakrak asked, are they that upset? Owen replied that they were desperate, because of all the friends, children and grandchildren they've lost. They have to get revenge on those damn frogs. Rakrak raised his hand and shouted that they had every right to be angry. All those who seek revenge, let them follow him. At one meeting, Shunan told Rakrak that a little more practice and he would be on the level of their warriors. The chief replied to him that he hit right in the center of the target, why isn't he at warrior level yet? Shunan said that this is not the main thing in shooting skill. He has both strength and accuracy but he spends too much time shooting. The chief asked if, instead of firing indiscriminately, he should aim at the enemy's vulnerable points. Frog replied that in a real battle, the target would move. First you need to slow down or stop the victim, and then you can finish him off. If they build friendship between the tribes, he will teach him how to make bows. All the materials are very simple. Any lizard can get them. Rakrak didn't realize what it was about the unpleasant feeling he felt then. Now all he has to do is find out in person from him, they're getting pretty close. Seeing his son named Ian, Owen hugged him tightly, for it had been so long since they had seen each other. The chief ordered you to send the wounded in a boat along with the children and go with them. Then have him move the grey-brown lizards to the lower part of the village to cause commotion among the enemies. You're asked, will they attack from both sides at the same time? Rakrak replied that after getting their attention, he would swim over with the warriors and could attack. But whether it would go well, Yur was worried. The chief said they were already fewer in number. And they had a new divine blessing. Their black scales are very hard to see in the water under the light of the moon, so that was the end of them. Chief Alroy was shocked at where they came from. They came out of nowhere. One by one, the frogs fell from the sharp spears of the lizards. Alroy cried out for the two-headed god to save him. Let him repay all the sacrifices he had made to him. Rakrak heard his prayers and threw his spear right at his head. Their god is no longer here. In the commotion, tried to escape. There were more of them, and they had poisoned weapons. His father can no longer command warriors. The lizards are poison-resistant, so arrows are no problem. He looked back to see his father, but that was when Rakrak crept up on him. The chief said he had finally found him. And he asked if Shunan was a warrior. Rakrak will be merciful and let him fall in the death of a warrior. Let him raise his weapon. Shaunan asked to be spared. What about their friendship? He holds no grudge against him at all. The two-headed monster also threatened them. Shaunan will tell him the secret. He'll tell you how to make a bow. He was interested in materials, wasn't he? They make them from the tendon from their backs. The chief asked what kind of creature's tendons did they use. Shaunan said of the lizards, he realized he had dug his own grave. Rakrak says he understood, they hold no grudge against each other. He has won an absolute victory, so he accepts his deal. After thinking about it, he told him to let him run if he cared so much for this life. Owen saw this and asked the chief why he let Shunan escape. The chief said it was fine, he just needed a moving target. The next day, Owen told Rakrak that he is much better with the bow. And the arrows fly right. The chief replied that if the bowstring was pulled a little tighter, it would tear immediately. It would be a good idea to make it stronger. Owen feels that they will not find better material under the present circumstances. The chief realizes this, and thinks it is time to leave this forest. Winter is approaching and this is the buffalo's habitat. Water buffalo move to warmer places in search of food. Rakrak asked, did Owen go hunting today too? He replied that yes, 
they took care of the frogs wandering around. Now for some time there will be no problems with the supply of material for onions. Owen inquired, now his goal of a great chief is Alroy. He replied that no, Alroy was just as injured as Shaunan. He will become someone's headdress, like his son's bones on it. As Owen tracked these guys down, he discovered something else this time. Jail noticed Ian, who was eavesdropping on the chief's conversation with his father. She asked the child what he was doing here. Does he have something to say to Rackrack? The guy wanted to show them his figurine that looked like their keeper. Everyone gathered when they saw Ian's figurine. The chief said it was beautiful and really well made. Ian said he wanted to give it to Rackrack. The chief asked if he was sure. Owen said in their day making and sharing items is quite a popular practice among the village children. Jail asked if other children in the village had many of these figures. Ian replied that many had one. It is that guardian who saved them because it is a great and kind being. Rackrack is sorry he only has one of these. Owen suggested looking around the village for more. The chief agreed, he would pay any price or he would trade it for something. But he's still interested in what Owen was talking about earlier. What did he find? In the cave where they were hiding he discovered something strange, he had never seen anything like this before. Without thinking for long, they decided to take the troops and rush over there. Owen said this is the entrance, the frogs used it as a hiding place, we need to go inside. Upon entering, the lizard also said that everyone inside had been killed. Isn't that suspicious? It's fascinating, but how was it possible to engrave something so detailed on such a hard stone? Jail remembered that this sign was similar to the one on the beetle's back. Nebula watched them intently. He thinks they are ancient ruins. There are many types of ancient ruins, you can use them to gain knowledge or discover wonders. Among them are items with certain functions or ruins where you can get demonic items. However, with such a low level of civilization, even if they mastered the ancient knowledge it wouldn't matter much. Miraculous ruins can create or alter special resources and great mysterious blessings. They are anchored in a specific location, and are of less value to Rackrack, since he is a nomad. The probability of a unique relic is very low. He hoped it wasn't the ruins of an ancient castle. There was a strange voice that asked who had come. A voice greeted the wanderer, and said that this was a demonic world. Once inside, they saw a huge number of staircases heading in different directions. Jail says it's deep here, they'll have to go through all these stairs. The chief thinks it would be good if they could jump down. His wife asked him if he was going to pray to their god. He replied that no, he did not want to bother their god for nothing. Suddenly they saw a large number of rats on their way. Jail said they were not rats, they were gutters. But why do they hiss so loud? And aren't they too big? They don't usually move in groups like this. They seem angry. It's the first time Owen's seen one, too. The chief said they were just monster rats then. They're probably the ones guarding this place. Keep everyone on their guard. The Nutria rushed at them without a second thought, but the lizard's sharp spears left them no chance. Rackrack asked if they could eat them. They will gut them and take them with them. Jail thought maybe there was an option to raise them on a farm? Like water buffalo, Rackrack asked. Owen said that if he wanted to do something new on the farm, how about fish? Rackrack asked, don't fish just appear and disappear on their own? Owen replied that they too breed and lay eggs. Even frogs knew this and prohibited fishing during the breeding season. All they will need to do is build a dam and keep them locked up while they are young. Owen will work out the details when they get back. Suddenly some of the nutria stung the lizard. The victim shouted that it was a rat still alive. He said he was going to take it to skin it. But as soon as he touched it, he felt a sharp and searing pain in his hand. Rackrack decided to try it himself and immediately felt something like lightning striking. Jail got worried and asked if he was okay. He replied that he was fine. The system notified that it's a devil-possessed Nutria. Her ability is electricity, she can attack the enemy with electricity with a simple touch. Besides, it's the ruins of a demonic castle. Electric demons are powerful. However, if Rackrack breaks through these ancient ruins, there is a high probability that he will gain demonic power. Mastering magical abilities will not immediately make him a mage, but with each generation the powers will become more powerful. They can create the descendants of sorcerers. But there is one problem. In the lost world, 
divinity and magic are in conflict. According to the setting, magic comes from ancient evil, not from God. Great magicians develop their own powers without relying on gods. If the number of such people increases, punishment will follow. It's not that there is no way to prevent it, but there are too many options. Gradually, the demonic ruins would reveal their true colors and tempt them. A shining stingray appeared and asked the chief if he wished to have such power. If he so desires it, he may give it to him. Jail asked if he wasn't feeling well, they could leave and come back here later, the chief immediately agreed. He stood up and told the boys to make sure all the rats were dead. Have them check their bows, spears, and other weapons. Rakrak realized that he was the only one who could see the creature. He asked mentally what it was. Scat replied that he is the spirit that protects this place. And is only seen by those who have great power. And to what power is he speaking? Rakrak realized that he could communicate by thought, but, his deepest feelings were not transmitted. Nebula wondered, after all he had a demonic spirit in front of him now, should he warn Rakrak? Looking at his ranking, he noticed that he had a new ability, cunning. But when did he acquire these abilities? Did he develop them while fighting Shunan? It was a mystery to Nebulus. Scat said that the power he was talking about was electricity. To burn living things with searing flames, the ability to give off light like the sun. And he can give him all that. The chief said that if he would give it to him he would be grateful. But the stingray replied that it was not so simple, there were certain conditions. That confused Rakrak, except that the stingray hadn't offered to give it to him? And said nothing about the terms. Scat said it was nothing, his power was enough. Rakrak replied that if he wanted to make a deal, he should have said so from the beginning. This disappointed him greatly. If the stingray wants something from him, let him show the appropriate attitude. And from now on, let him be careful. Let him at last speak his terms. What can he give him? Let him say exactly what he wants from him. If he tries to hide something, there will be no further conversation. Jail approached Rakrak and told him that everyone was ready to go. He replied that let them go, catch up with them later. Skath says he's trapped in these ruins and can't get out of this place. He wants Rakrak to go down and defeat the guardian who protects the seal. Then he will gain his freedom and grant him his great ability. The chief asked, is he talking about the sparkling power of these monstrous rats? The man replied that this was not a correct description, but it was true. Its ability is called electricity. Right now, it can only create sparks. But the more he uses it, the more powerful it will become. With it, the chief will even be able to summon a real thunderstorm. This ability can improve and develop, and someday even become comparable to divine power. His ability is so vast that Rakrak can master it. Not just him, but another member of their tribe could use it as well. If he wants to monopolize it, he can do the ritual. The chief said it's unbelievable, but why would a creature with such power be locked up here? Scat replied that it was because his ability was too powerful. Aren't dangerous things always sealed? Since it can't be defeated, it's trapped. The chief asked, what's next? He had just shown how dangerous he was, Rakrak thinks the stingray is hiding something from him. Maybe there are more side effects than benefits after using his ability. Let him lie to him no more he could go and just destroy the entrance to the cave. So that no one can find these ruins. Scat stopped the chief and said he would tell him everything, just please let him hear him out. He was one of the beings that once ruled this world. He was also descended from an ancient demon long forgotten. Neither the gods nor he could remember their origins. He was trapped here for an unknown amount of time. Abilities with unknown origins stupefy people. Since they do not know the cause of the powers, they mistakenly believe that these powers belong to them. Rakrak had already seen those whose minds were stupefied with power. Was it demonic power that was affecting them? Scat said exactly that. Besides, his abilities are randomized. Possessors are chosen at random. The chief understood it all, God's power is given to those who are chosen by his judgment. On the other hand, even those who do not know how to handle power can master it. It develops over time. In the end, there are bound to be people who will defile God and rebel against Him. But this ability is definitely powerful and desirable. It will be useful in battle, 
is there really no way out here? Rakrak agrees, but he has conditions to him. Skath asked, what are they? First, this ability is randomly passed on, but he said it could be monopolized. If so, is it possible to grant it to only a select few? Skath thinks so, but why would he do that? He believes that if this gift is only given to a select few, it will be seen as God's choice. Then the creatures will cease to defy God. And of course the second condition, he must believe in their Lord too. Skat wondered, how could that be? After all, he is a demonic spirit. He is older than all their gods. Rakrak said it didn't matter, what mattered was what he would do in the future. That's just ridiculous, gods don't like demonic spirits. The chief said not to judge their god with your prejudices. He thinks the unnamed god of bugs is generous, and all the more the stingray seems useful. Would his god accept him? The chief replied that if he agreed to the terms, of course. The demonic spirit said that it wasn't actually trapped in these ruins, but it ruled over them. Those gutters were just an attempt to break him. It was a test to see if the chief was right for him. But he's going to cheat him anyway, isn't he angry? Rakrak says he understands, so he's forgiven. Since he's living with those monstrous rats in such a dark place, he should be more tolerant. The chief thinks to the spirit, should go outside and see many beautiful places. Skat asked his name, the chief said his name was Rakrak. Now that's great, test passed. If the god of the leader accepts the demonic spirit, this ability will become his. The system has notified that a demonic spirit wishes to be his subordinate. If Nebula agrees, he will receive the demonic gift of electricity, possess this spirit and join him to the Holy One. In this way, he can overcome the punishment and gain demonic ability. Well done Rakrak, it seems their meeting was a good one for both of them. The demonic gift of electricity has been received, so the unnamed god of beetles gave Rakrak the ability and he mastered the power of thunder and lightning. This is what the story of the black lizard looks like. This is how the chosen one began. It's been nine years since then. The man asked, but what does the unnamed god of bugs have to do with thunderstorms? The lizard decided to ask a counter question. What color is the lightning? He answered that it was blue. The second question, what is the name of their god? He gave the answer, the blue god of insects, but he still doesn't realize it. The man said that in this long story, they never introduced themselves. His name is Y. The lizard replied that they would have to end this conversation there. Looks like they've got uninvited guests. They're either gnolls or hyena men. They are warlike savages, a crazy race. The lizard has a question for the traveler Y. Do they look like the men from Socket? The man replied that they were defenseless, lacked vigilance and were poorly armed. To him, they're just wandering gnolls. The lizard said that was pretty good reasoning, that's exactly what he thinks. But does that mean they should crush them? The lizard fired his energy arrow and hit right next to one of the hyenas. Their commander shouted that it was an enemy attack. The powerful energy from the arrow struck them. Damn that lizard, they said, and began to retreat. The valiant lizard remembered to introduce himself, his name is Owen. Why couldn't believe his ears, is this really Owen? He's talking to someone so great. The lizard said he hadn't used his power in a while and suggested we take a break. And have a little talk. Why knows that this smoking pipe and tobacco like ritual paraphernalia used by select black lizards to replenish their strength. Owen said it's fine, if he has questions he can ask. The man asked, if Owen had such power, why follow someone? He's not talking about betrayal. Just why does such a great lizard live such a hard life wandering alone in this wilderness? There's one reason, he's full of sins. Owen once betrayed many of his people, however, he has been shown the path of redemption. His goal is to spread the names of the blue insect god and the chief of the Rakrak tribe through stories and writings. This path of redemption he chose for himself, why believes that even without it, there's hardly anyone here who hasn't heard of the Black Scale tribe. No need to mention the reputation of Rakrak, the great priest and chief. Owen replied that so, if anyone attacked him, it would scare them away, that was all. The lizard asked if he was also a wanderer. Why said he was, coming straight from automation. He tries to convey the words of the automation lord and heads towards the Black Scale tribe. Owen bowed and said he didn't realize he was a guest but that was quite good. With a whistle, 
the lizard called for his transport. Why froze in place, was it cockatrice? Owen says he's right, but only half right. It's Kokorka, specifically a mix of cockatrice and chicken. Let him jump in, Lizard hasn't been there in a while either and was just about to visit Rakrak, so he'll take him. In return, he would have to listen to the story to the end. Why said he would love to? Will he tell the story of the Blue Beetle God or the Rakrak Saga? Owen replied that a little of both. Meanwhile, the great chief was notified that an elderly stargazer said his life was on the line, and he thinks he can't talk to the tribal chief anymore, unless it's now. Rakrak told Commander Yur to leave the procession. Have them prepare to stay here tonight. Yur shouted at the top of his voice to stop, it was an order from the chief. Jail asked if there was a problem. The chief told her to tell the stargazer that he would be arriving soon and tell him to make sure he lives to see it. He was always good at predicting the future, let him take care of the funeral. It will be a sad night. On arriving at the cabin, the doctor notified the chief that she had done all that was in her power, but that he had not much time left. The old man said that a lot had happened both here and there. He had traveled to many places and lands and had learned a lot. He lost an arm and was banished, but most importantly, he met a tribal leader and taught many people to contemplate the sky. However, if you're a lizard, one day there will come a time when overwhelming fatigue and exhaustion sets in. The only way to cure this affliction is to sleep forever. He decided to be a little extravagant before his last journey and steal time from the busiest personality of this tribe. Isn't time more valuable than anything else? The chief smiled and said that the old man was still joking. He has a question that no one but he is capable of answering. When they die, what really happens to them? He is the first chosen, this is a question for him, the priest, the closest to God. What awaits them after death? They say that when they die, they fall into eternal sleep. Does he think they'll have nightmares forever? Does the great leader believe this? Rakrak replied that he didn't know why the old man thought he could answer that question. That's because the blue insect god saved them when they got lost. So he hopes that he will continue to guide them even after they leave the world of the living, such is his faith. Does he think it is different from God's will? The chief replied that no, the stargazer is right. The blue god of insects guides them whenever they get lost. He will surely not leave them even after death. Rakrak thinks so. What kind of place will it be? Will they begin by standing face to face with God and exchanging awkward greetings? He thinks it wouldn't be so bad. Maybe there would be a huge field where they could run around as much as they wanted. A space where a slight crunch would rejoice with every step, and the tip of his tail would touch the soft meadow grass. There will also be a big boulder to lie down and rest on. The weather will always be nice. Although maybe not, it would be boring if it was always the same so it'll be cloudy and rainy at times. And of course there's a beautiful river. Stargazer said he wished he had a house he could rest in. Not a tent that gives the impression of moving again soon, but a solid home where he can settle in. He had never liked tents and was tired of moving from place to place. But if his heart could find a place to rest while he breathed, he would have nothing to complain about. The old man asked if there were stars in the sky. Rakrak replied that there would be no loneliness there. God must have created the stars so they could navigate so they could return to their homes without problems. A blue butterfly came into their chamber. The chief asked if the stargazer could see it. The old man replied that his eyes were getting dark, what is this about? The chief said he had a gift for him. What kind of gift asked the stargazer, is he thinking of fooling around again? Rakrak replied, is he going to refuse his gift again? The old man said he would find him quickly this time. Those were his last words, Nebula's butterfly had taken his soul. He wondered what might happen if one died in a lost world. The system has notified that the conditions for creating an afterlife have been established. Does he want to create an afterlife? The conditions for this quiet death are not yet clear, but he agrees. The afterlife is a very important element in lost world. Even just having a well-thought-out view of the afterlife can increase your chances of winning. The wicked are condemned to endless suffering, while the good go to heaven. This division exists to maintain morality and ethics. Like Valhalla, it can also be used as a training ground for warriors. Afterwards, the souls trained in the afterlife can be sent back to earth. This will eventually come in handy later on in the game. There is no need to rush now, 
much is still just beginning. Nebula can control this afterlife any way she wants. Stargazer was now in the ancient meadow. When he opened his eyes from the bright rays of the sun, he noticed that his hand was still there. Looking around he couldn't believe his eyes. Rakrak was right, this was the meadow he had spoken of. There are no stars there, and no stone houses. Perhaps he shouldn't have hoped for any of that. Maybe he doesn't need a home at all. It's a really nice gift. Turning around, the stargazer saw that there were other lizards here. But, they still hadn't woken up. There are other deceased people here besides him. It would be rude to wake them now. Suddenly the stargazer sees a child he knows. He is one of the warriors who learned arithmetic from him. It happened when an alliance of goblins broke through their tribe's defenses and ambushed them. Places populated by children and the elderly were in great danger, they could only hope for the arrival of reinforcements. And he realized that they were completely powerless. And he thought their end was near. But this child stood up for himself and said that at the cost of one life, many others could be saved. And he's glad he learned to count, thanks to him. A few warriors from the Black Scale tribe disobeyed the chief's orders, because they felt it was necessary. It was a heroic sacrifice that no one wanted. At the funeral of the warriors who never returned to their native land, Rakrak was very angry. He thought it was because of the cursed arithmetic that Stargazer had taught them. The warriors, who were good at counting, disobeyed his orders and rushed into battle. They thought it was a good choice to save two lives at the cost of one. Stargazer asked, does the chief think these warriors were wrong? He replied that he was angry because they were right. All he can do is get angry. After that incident, warriors who were not interested in arithmetic began to study it in secret. He was the one who inspired many to learn numeracy. Stargazer is very happy to meet him again. This little fellow has a very brave heart. He wondered, is there really only meadows here? Is there nothing divine in this place? Suddenly he saw another lizard come to a stop. He yelled for it to stop. He had to rush after him. Had that lizard disappeared before his eyes, walked into that building? If there was a deity here after all, he'd like to ask him a question. Why did God choose them? Is it because lizards are superior to other races? Because the deity favors them? Or because they are useful? Probably no one would answer those questions. Rakrak said it could just be a coincidence. It was an inevitable choice and perhaps just a result of them doing their best. But in the end, it means they did a good job, so it wasn't that bad, he thinks. Suddenly he saw the telescope for the first time. Rakrak was right, there are stone houses and stars here. Touched it and realized the body was made of brass. And some kind of crystal on the tip. When he looked into it, it was as if he was at a loss for words. Seeing the stars for the first time, that's what they really are. He needs to recalculate the movement of the stars. All his knowledge was superficial. If he could share this knowledge with the living, that would be awesome. Watching him, Nebula said that the stargazer had traveled a long way. The afterlife is not just a place where the dead go, it also has a huge impact on the values of those who believe in a deity. If you send warriors to the afterlife, their race will dream of Valhalla, and if immortals are there, they will start dreaming of the land of the peach blossom. Stargazer realizes that if the scientists found out about this, it would lay the groundwork for the technological process. Especially since a new threat is coming, the afterlife must begin to function properly. A tribe with cropped ears, have iron technology superior to lizards, have tamed saber-toothed tigers, and they're coming. Their technique and movements are unusual. There's probably a player behind this. Fighting them won't be easy, but now they have an afterlife. We must prepare to welcome them properly. The players are gradually expanding their territories. To keep them in check, he invested quite well in small bugs. He has three large swarms under his control. A swarm of locusts is called a swarm and can control farming players. Nebula acts quietly, so that no one notices his presence. The strategy is vector, he's used it before, they're useful for spreading a lot of diseases. And of course the nest where different species of beetles are raised. It lets them breed in small areas. The humanoid lizard tribes in the area obey Rakrak. He unites the tribes one by one. Taking control of the southern peninsula is only a matter of time. 
what will he do with the emotional players? Owen and Y finally made it to the Rockrack tribe. They were immediately informed that Stargazer had died today. The man said he'd heard of him before and thought it wasn't a good time to talk. Owen replied that it was fine. They don't think it's bad when a stranger comes to a funeral. On the contrary, they think it's a good sign. Is it wrong for someone else to share their grief? The man saw the chief for the first time and wondered why the head of the tribe was crying. Owen said, don't others cry when they are sad? We replied that chiefs don't usually do this in front of tribesmen because they have to maintain authority. Owen knows what authority is, but if a leader shows weakness, will the warriors under his command think their commander is weak? Let him not try to force it on the humanoid lizards, they wouldn't understand it anyway. They have what they revere more than authority. It is necessary to know this in order to understand it. Rakrak greeted the guys, he's glad Owen made it to the funeral in time. But who is that man with him? Owen replied that the man had come to fulfill an errand from the Lord of Automation. His name is Wee, and he's from Automation. Owen decided to tell the chief something he absolutely needed to know. Entering the tent just the two of them, the chief said he must be tired from the road. But unfortunately they would be up all night, and he hopes the man will understand, that's their tradition. Y replied that it was okay. First of all, he wants the chief to accept this from him. This is from the Lord of Automation, Saltstone, their specialty, which they are proud of. It is considered the first salt stone that the Lord of Automation gives him and demands nothing in return. The chief asked, does that mean there will be a second and a third? Y replied that even more, the main thing is to accept it. Rakrak clenched his fist and broke that stone into small pieces before his eyes. Let him tell his master that he has accepted it. Y asked, what does that mean? The chief replied that he could not understand it because he had no god. It is just one of the rituals. If you scatter some salt rock on the floor, it will propitiate God. That's all he needs to know. Why thinks it's a ridiculous lie, it was a gift from the Lord of Automation. Rakrak said it was just a small piece of salt rock. So he used it, what's the problem? The man replied that the purpose of this gift was different. He did say that the Lord of Automation had said there would be a second, and a third, and more. Rakrak had heard that the Lord of Automation was rich, but sending a man to bring so much salt was a bit extravagant. He's right though, next time, hopefully the one will bring more. Y realized that the chieftain was experienced. It's not that he can't communicate because of the different races. Rakrak is unpleasant, but not rude. And diplomatic in his refusal. The chief, like people, speaks with dignity, and does not like to put hidden meanings into words. If something like this happens, he is used to solving it with history. Why doesn't have that talent either, so if he doesn't like diplomatic rhetoric, let him speak plainly. If the chief understood the offer, why did he refuse? First of all, he doesn't like to accept offers that others have turned down. If someone has already refused once, doesn't that mean the offer is unfavorable? These words made the man think. He said it wasn't like that, it was an offer the Lord of Automation had made only to him. The chieftain asked, did he think Owen had stumbled upon it by accident and was so lucky to have brought it to him? According to him, Y came from the north, not the west. Automation is in the west, and in the northern wilderness is Salkaida with cropped ears. That means he had already offered the same thing to Sock Knight and was turned down. Now why doesn't he tell him everything honestly? What's we hiding from automation? An ancient relic, an automated city. Saturn is an ancient relic that you won't find anywhere else. A real fortress with walls of five meters. And then there's the mud wars that are reclaiming Saturn. That, too, is a true wonder of the lost world. In this fortress, which is unknown who built it, there are many people and different tribes living together. Plus it has a geographical advantage. The valley where automation is located, the path to the continent. It's in a great location, which is why automation, is so protected. There's a salt mine there, it helps with livestock and farming. Rakrak said he didn't believe in free gifts. Especially if it's a gift from someone hiding their real identity. There's no way he can accept that. If we doesn't deny it, then let him let him tell how he came to that conclusion. The man probably knows how the lizards feel about the autonomous city. And he probably told them about it to see how much data they had on it. And even considering the castle, 
few people know him personally. It is said that only the four families loyal to the castle know him, people who are of the same blood as the Lord have Y in their name. Rakrak heard that the Lord has four sons and three daughters, however, he's not a woman, and judging by the wrinkles on his arms, he's definitely not a young man. It turns out he's the ruler of the automated city, Vizio. The man said he was good at what he did. But how could the chief know? There are no lizards in his entourage. That's right, his name is Vizio, the lord of the castle. But that doesn't change anything, he actually gave him salt for free. Rakrak said no, she has a price. Even the greedy Sockites refused it, because they too understand the point. If he gets his salt, they will have to defend them when they are attacked by enemies, since they would be worried about the safety of the mine. They would have to help even if they got into the fight themselves. Isn't that what Wizio wanted? The Lord replied that it is called diplomacy. And it can also be called a transaction. Why does he refuse if he knows it will do him good? Rakrak said that Vizio had already heard the answer to that question. Why don't they just take over their town? If they kick the people out, the salt mine will be theirs, won't it? The man said, so they would attack them? The chief said no, he was only speculating about what would be best for them. Such diplomacy won't do them any good so wouldn't it be better for them to take over the city? Wizio said that he did not underestimate them. The chief replied that if his calculations were correct, his warriors could do it, with few casualties. They follow the blue insect god and if the god helps them, the high fence and dirt soldiers will turn to ashes. Moreover, isn't he afraid to come to them alone? A man makes their job a lot easier. Vizio doesn't think so, if he dies here, no one will know who the next heir to the castle is. The chief asked, what does the town's heritage have to do with them? The man replied, doesn't the great chief know a game called Go? They place white and black stones at the intersections of the lines. The one who completely covers the opponent's stones wins. But those rules aren't so important right now. What's important is that he's a rock on the board. Rakrak seems to have figured it all out, the game has already begun. In this game, the gods play using their races as stones, and the gnolls and lizards have already started playing this game. It's called Autonomous City. The chief has already made a decision in the order of inheritance of the town, hasn't he? Some of the time his children started talking about teeth full of anger, while others talked about the blue butterfly. His children have begun to believe in the gods. Unfortunately, Rakrak can't do anything about it. It doesn't hurt them as much as the attack on the city. Three weeks ago, there was a clash of civilizations. Hegemony greeted Nebula, it had been a while since they had seen each other. He found that odd, since when had they become friends? Doesn't he remember them playing the last game of Lost World together? Nebula said aside from this trivialized story is there a reason he abandoned this conversation? But didn't that game mean anything to him? He was worried about the holy strategy of orcs who follow trends. But doesn't Hegemony find it boring when he's trying to be lawyered up? He said he was sure to win this time and would definitely nail him. Nebula replied that he always says stupid things. Why would they fight? Who benefits? Maybe Hegemony has forgotten that there will be no other attempt to play. This is their last game. He replied that he knows, he just got a little carried away. Nebula understands his style of play. He may seem simple at first, but he has a good flair for conflict. He's also good at multitasking at the same time. In fact, he often won by starting the war early on, but he doesn't need to adjust for his peculiarities. Hegemony asked, getting Nebula, wants to determine who is better by using a different method? Toth replied that yes, they both want the same thing. They are putting an autonomous city and people on the line. They'll try to use a controversial prophecy. Prophecy is a skill that is available if your divinity is level 6 or higher. It's similar to a quest that players issue themselves, if you fulfill the prophecy you get extra experience points. But the penalty for failure is also high. Reduced experience points due to wasting religious resources, and also a bad event can happen. Nebula asked, then what happens if two players have opposite prophecies? Hegemony replied that in such a case the prophecy is called contradictory. One side gets a reward and the other side gets a penalty, perfect. Then which prophecy will they choose? Nebula asked if he knew that the lord of the city was going to choose his heir. Hegemony replied that yes, 
an autonomous city regularly chooses its ruler and only the ruler knows how long the ruler will stay in power. In that case, Nebula offered to place his bets. Who will be the next head of the castle? Are they talking about his five children? Nebula replied that if they chose different candidates, the conditions for the controversial prophecy would be fulfilled. Hegemony said he had a list, could share it with him. The latter replied that would be fine. The first son, his name is Dan, a man in his thirties. He is strong in body and trusted by Vizio. And he's also getting endorsements from two of the four major families, and is now considered the strongest candidate. Second son's name is June. He's a little under thirty. He's Dan's half-brother, and he's considered weak. June rarely shows himself to the others, and there are rumors that he is not interested in the ruler's position. But he is supported by his family on his mother's side. The third child is Jean. A girl in her mid-twenties. She and the first child have the same mother. She hides her identity and goes out to party a lot. She's also good with tough people, kind of like a hunter. She has one remaining family on her side. The fourth child is Kyung, a girl in her early twenties. She and the first two children have different mothers. Hegemony thinks her mom is already dead, and she has a strange appearance, possibly cursed. Because of this, not only the Lord, but all family members avoid her as much as they can. The last child's name is Min, the girl is still a teenager. People say that she is extremely intelligent and talented in many ways. She got her father's love as she is the youngest child. That's it, now they need to make their choice. Or does Nebula need time for the information to settle in his head? He replied that no, you can decide right away. He offered to choose his person individually, and then compare to make sure they didn't pick the same heir. System notified, Nebula wants to predict a controversial prophecy with player hegemony? If defeated, he will suffer heavy losses. He clicked that he agreed. Hegemony prophecy, Wizio's second son, Y. June, will be the heir to the autonomous city. Nebula's prophecy is that Wizio's second daughter, Y. Kyung, will be the heir to the autonomous city. Hegemony seemed surprised. He didn't expect it from him. Nebula said that's great, they picked different people. So he just pressed the yes button. As he says, replied Hegemony. Now it was his turn to press on and we could begin. The contest between Hegemony and Nebula was approved. Vizio had come here to learn the source of the rumors that had been on the lips of others for three weeks. The two tribes had moved closer to the autonomous city. Rakrak realizes that they both have large numbers and will be hard to deal with. One of them must be behind the rumor spreading. Vizio said since he hasn't died yet after meeting both chiefs, it means he's just a stone on the board. This gives him a forlorn confidence. The chief thinks it's easy when you can put diplomacy and respect aside. And he can choose one of the two, Sockate or Rakrak, Knolls or lizard men, The god of evil teeth or the nameless god of beetles? The man replied that it's not that simple. He thinks that in this situation the question is whether it would hurt less to put your head in the mouth of a saber-toothed tiger or a lizard. Rakraku felt sorry for him but wouldn't it be better to put his head in the lizard's mouth? Sockate told the man it would be better to choose the tiger, and if he lets them fight amongst themselves, the winner will be exhausted. It looks like the lord wants to back off. Or is he not ready to make a decision? At least to Rakrak it looks that way when he says he accepts the fate of the stone on the board. Vizio said that was enough, but he had one last question. Eventually Rakrak himself will end up as a stone at the crossroads of lines, does that not make him angry or scared? The chief said he would answer that question when he had dealt with everything. Vizio understood, he came out and said he didn't need to be seen off. The man was expected by his men. They gave him different clothes and he shaved his beard, apparently such is the true face of the leader of an autonomous city. Three weeks ago, a fourth child named Kyung was on the verge of death. She thought she could pass it with a wagon but something went wrong. People said she was cursed and that she had killed her mother in childbirth, and also that there had been accidents all around her since she was a child. At 13, she fell down the steps at the market. At 14 she was accused of stealing salt and placed in jail for four days. At 15, she fell in the toilet. And no joke, the girl almost died. Once even a jug of water fell on her head, 
and there was also an incident when a pack of stray dogs chased her all night. So she thinks it's nothing now. What was she even thinking, passing with a wagon here is unrealistic, now she's lost all her silk. And there's nowhere to step, but it's okay. Because she's the best at taking pain. If she climbs up, stepping on both feet at the same time, she'll do well. Suddenly a lizard appeared from somewhere and offered his help. Let her take hold of his hand. The girl asked what the lizard was doing here. He replied that he didn't think she could afford to have long conversations. Kyung said she has nothing, she's broke, let her calm down. The lizard grabbed her arm and lifted her up. He didn't need anything from her. This road is barely enough for one person to pass, also because of the precipice she is risking her life. What was she thinking when she pulled the wagon here? Kyung replied that if the wheels hadn't broken, there wouldn't have been a problem. She asked what his name was. The lizard replied that his name was Sira Mule. The least she can do is thank him for saving her. The lizard stopped her by calling her by name, they weren't done talking yet. The girl froze in place with fear, how did he know her name? She slipped her hand into her pocket to pull out her knife. Mule replied that Rakrak had told him and also ordered him to find her. Is he talking about the chief of the Black Sheik tribe? About the hunter and the thunder lizard? Is this the chosen one? The lizard replied that they just call him chief, but why is he looking for her? Mule said it might be because of the rumors that have been going around lately. The girl had recently gone to the distance for silk, so she hadn't heard any rumors. No wonder things had gone downhill. Mule had heard that the lord's second child would become the next ruler of their city. And someone claims that the fourth child will become the head of the castle. Kyung says it's just a rumor. Lizard knows she's Wizio's fourth child. He may not know, but these rumors have nothing to do with her, she's an outcast. Probably one of her brothers or sisters started the rumors, because they could have benefited from it. They can't get anything from her, so let her turn her eyes to another family member. He knows perfectly well who she is, and the castle lord's children must hide their identities. It's an ironclad law of autonomy. This lizard looks strong, but she may have to kill it. Mule said she misunderstood him. The second order of business was to protect her life. She said it's just a rumor, and it's understandable that siblings might react badly to it. They will make her their target so she won't be a rival for them. But, Kyung believes she can protect herself. Mule had received orders from the chief and was obliged to protect her. These words made the girl a little furious. She showed him her broken horns, a curse. Kyung was born after ripping her mother's belly open with her horns. And on top of that, her life is full of other failures and accidents, so she's a loner. Mule is very sorry, but it doesn't matter if she's really cursed or not. He still has to do the bidding of their leader. Even if Kyung refuses, he will still be there for her, she has no other choice. If scaring him away didn't work, the only thing left to do was to make him feel her hardship. Does she have to go with a huge, strong lizard now? However, she realized that it wasn't so bad. He would come to her rescue, even if he was in danger. She has to get the silk first, she has to go down and she'll be back. Mool doesn't think she can do anything with her leg. If a girl wants to make people listen to her, there's a better way to do it. She could ask him to help. Kyung blushed in embarrassment and asked if he could help bring her silk. The lizard replied that of course he would help. The girl asked how he knew she was here. Mule said he asked around, calling her fake name, Man G. Doesn't that name suit her better? She's more concerned that her business partners sold information about her so easily. Mule replied that they laid it all out for him at once when he gave them each a bag of salt. They also said that she had been planning to go into the silk business for a long time. But they didn't know where the girl got it from. They also said she borrowed a wagon and never came back. So they thought they'd been tricked. It had been several days since Kyung had disappeared from the town. Does she think she has lost the trust of her business associates and others? However, they can leave this conversation as the autonomous city is already visible. The girl said that only some traders from the autonomous city know this way. When she returns, she'll talk to Jo's family about selling the silk. Suddenly someone attacked them from behind, the lizard managed to get his arm up and deflect the blow. Mule said Rakrak was right, someone is trying to kill her, the battle for the throne has begun. He made quick work of them, 
tying them all up so they wouldn't run away. Kyung said that Mule is a pretty good fighter. She knows that Yur is the most famous among the lizards. It's true, Yur is the best warrior of the tribe, he learned everything from him. The girl asked if he had learned healing from him as well. Mule replied that no, it was taught by Jael when he was her servant. Jael is in charge of the internal affairs of the tribe. She is literally a female version of Rakrak. He was a servant under the direct protection of Jael herself. He also learned to fight from Yur. So he's some kind of big shot in the Black Hyde tribe, and someone like him was sent to protect her. She thinks she's very lucky. Mule gave them some silk. This infuriated the girl as to why the lizard was giving them her silk. He replied that it was necessary to bribe them. When they reached the town, they saw that the castle gates were closed, the guards not allowing anyone to pass. Kyung asked the passers-by why the gate of the autonomous city was closed, she was told that if she was a silk merchant, she couldn't get in. They say the entrance to the city is closed indefinitely, and if he gets in, he can't get out. Without thinking for a long time, the boys walked in and headed over to Jao's family to provide the silk. Kyung asked the guy, what was the look on his face? She's the one who should be angry. The cart she was taking fell apart and she almost died. He said it looked like the girl hadn't heard anything yet. On the way back, did anything strange happen to them? Kyun replied that she was almost killed. But she was lucky that the Black Lizard tribe had sent a warrior to protect her. It would be nice to thank him. The lizard introduced himself, he is Sira Mule of the Black Scale tribe. The guy is a pleasure to meet, he's the leader of the Jao family one of the four families of the autonomous city. Mule has talked to the goblins who tried to kill this young lady and it seems that Jao's family had nothing to do with it. He replied that of course, since they don't do mean things, unlike other families. Kyung asked, what really happened in the castle? It obviously wasn't because the damned fourth daughter had been assassinated. It happened here too, the lord is away, there was an assassination attempt here, and the potential heir to the autonomous city her brother, Wai Dan, is missing. Kyung said it's been a very long time since the last time she was here. Though she was close to her older brother, over time they began to avoid each other. Suddenly, Mool said he smelled blood at the bottom of the table. They saw a large number of footprints. With that many, he's probably dead by now. The guy came back and said they found it too. Problem is, they couldn't find the body. To prevent the culprit from escaping, they locked the gate as soon as they discovered the tracks. The city was immediately sealed off and trade was suspended. Now only time is needed to catch the culprit. Kyung thought, did the assassin dare to do this, realizing all the possible risks? She shouldn't think about it too much. Like he said, there was nothing he could do. Suddenly she heard a voice in her head. It asked if she wanted to know everything. Or would she pretend again that it didn't concern her? Mule looked at her and asked if she was okay. The voice told her that the culprit could have just put the body in salt and thrown it away. The killer made a barrel to hold the body. Who doesn't raise suspicion in a case like this? You need to look among those who are in the business of producing or storing their own meat. Mule guessed it was butchers and hunters. He did it to keep the meat from rotting. To keep the body from rotting, the killer put it in salt to throw away later. A man who can smuggle a hunter into a castle with him, and stores a lot of dried meat in barrels at his house. The lord asked, but who can go in and out of this room in peace? She is a hunter in the struggle for the throne of an autonomous city. Her older sister is Wai Jin. Wai Kyung's reasoning was convincing. Only a few people in the castle were informed of what had happened. But when Wai Dan's death became known to everyone in town, Everyone came to the conclusion that Wai Jean was the prime suspect. She thought she had planned everything perfectly. I'm surprised that some simpleton Wai Kyung figured it out so quickly. On her way to escape, she was met by Wai Min. She told her sister that she just underestimated everyone around her. Wai Jean asked, how did they get here? Wai Min's archers killed her assistant in a flash. The girl asked, what had made her so angry? Wasn't she the one who killed Brother Dan? If Wai Min did the same to her, then she has no right to be outraged. Only the strongest of them is worthy to rule. She killed him for the throne, didn't she? So it's time to end their damn family ties. Those were her last words to her older sister, the archers had done their job. However, it was over for her too, 
a sharp dagger piercing her chest. It's her older brother, Wai Jun. The guy says she's right, that's exactly what he's going to do. Now out of all his siblings, there was only one obstacle left. Wai Kyung doesn't have long to live. The girl was surprised to learn that Wai Jin and Wai Min were found dead next to Wai Dan's body. The Lord said it meant that the murderer was not going to hide. Of course, she replied, even a fool would understand. Wai Jin made the first move, and Wai Min anticipated it and waited for her. And understanding perfectly the thoughts of both sisters, he waited for their meeting to get rid of two birds with one stone. If the goblin attack was Wai Jun's doing, then everything fits. If Mule was late, it could be made to look like a roadside robbery. The Lord said that the real struggle for the throne was beginning. Kyung replied that it was already clear to everyone. The Gao family just had a meeting about it. The girl asked, and what is the Jao family's decision? The Lord replied that it is quite obvious that Wai Jun is now dominating their fight, so they decided to bet on her. There's always been a chance. However, it is only inaccurate calculations and to some extent excitement rather than blind faith. Kyung thanked her and said she understood, so there's just surviving. The girl said she'd do her best. She decided to fight on, despite that damned body. It seems that for the first time there is someone who believes in her. Another interview on the subject was in progress and many ideas flew between the ears of our heroes. Attempted murder is unacceptable. They must catch Wai Jun. The man said that the Sun family is on Wai Jun's side, so it's not an easy task. Shouldn't we get Su's family on their side? Looking at Kyung, Mule said let her not even think of cutting off her horns. It's okay that they grew back again. The girl replied that okay, she had already given up on that. If she had known there would be so much blood, she wouldn't have even tried it. Said it was fine, Kyung didn't want to bring up the subject of her horns again. If you compare her life 15 days ago to now, she just wasn't used to them. Mool said let her think of them as a reward for all the suffering she's endured over the past couple weeks. A guy came in and notified everyone that there was news from outside the castle. The Holy Lord will be here soon. Kyung asked when he would arrive. The boy replied that the Lord wasn't moving that fast, so he wouldn't arrive until tomorrow morning at the earliest. And there's also news from the scouts that he can only tell her in person. However, this guy didn't want to say anything. He tried to pull out his knife to kill Kyung, but he failed. Mule and the goblin destroyed him. The lizard asked if this guy wasn't one of Jao's family. One of the goblins said he was, he thinks he was bribed. Mule thinks he shouldn't trust the Jao family members now. Suddenly they heard many voices coming from the street. As it turned out Wai Jun had been preparing an attack for a long time before the Lord arrived, it seems like everyone here wants to end things right here and now. Kyung always hoped she never used that path. Mule said there's no safer way than this way. Even if she doesn't like it, they can't go back. Given the circumstances, they have no choice. The girl said she was going first. Don't just stand there, let him come down quickly. They'll be here any minute. Mule is shocked, she definitely has a stronger stomach than he thought. She says she's used to bugs by now. When Kyung was little and was going to the bathroom, she accidentally fell in one time. The lizard asked, why is she talking about it like that, as if it's a common situation at all? It's not like it's a joke. He's right about that, the girl almost died. It was because the floor was rotten. Then she got stuck in a huge pile of shit. She managed to roll into the sewer and not get hurt. But she didn't see a single ray of light and thought it was the end. Seeing blue orbs flying around, she followed the light and saw the outline of an exit and a sewer. Kyung decided to catch one of these orbs and it turned out it was just a bug with light coming out of its tail, they were fireflies. Mule said they don't come to places like this. She doesn't know, but there really were a lot of them. I mean, she even managed to catch one. It seemed very strange, because they were in the sewers, where they don't live at all. Well, maybe it was a different species. They had finally reached, he had discovered this exit during his recircumnavigation of the area. The passage leads to the basement of Seven Sous hunting cabin. Mule will go first, so please have him wait here. If he doesn't come back after a while, then immediately have him run in the opposite direction. Kyung realizes that she is still alive only because of Mule's caution. They've had a few fights. 
so much has happened in the last three weeks, we'll just have to wait here. But suddenly the girl heard a loud voice and realized she couldn't just wait, pulled out her knife and headed for the exit. She will no longer just watch someone die. The first thing Kyung saw was his friend Mule standing there bleeding. He shouted to her, why did she get up? Why June said it's too late. Let him think that this lizard is already dead. Mule shouted at him to shut up. The boy was surprised the lizard still had the energy to talk. Wai Jun ordered his men to forget about the lizard, let them kill Wai Kyung. Mules got them all scattered all over the place. They don't stand a chance, he won't give up. Kyung had the choice to run, she knows it was the only and right decision, right? But why did she disobey and do such a stupid thing? The girl answered that she didn't know. Sometimes people will consciously choose to do something wrong, knowing it's a big mistake even if it ends up leading to their own demise. It's not like she's a person though, you have to generalize that concept. The chief simply ordered him to protect her, he didn't ask her to risk her life, but now they're in the same boat with her. Wai Jun said that whoever kills the lizard and Wai Kyung will be rewarded with a whole cartload of silk. How long are they going to give in to this lizard? He's wounded, let them put their honor on the line and kill them. His men said his spirit was too fierce to call him an ordinary warrior. There were even rumors that he was one of the chosen ones. Why Jun doesn't think so, if he's the chosen one, why would he hide his true powers until he was pierced in the back with a spear? Looking at the wall, he realized that there was a large concentration of salt crystals and obviously a salt mine nearby. Mule informed Kyung that they were about to run to the right. The girl asked, toward that wall? As Wai Jun said, he's not the chosen one but that doesn't mean he's considered a weak warrior. Mule is the second strongest of the lizards. But no one remembers second. Let her remember, they run to the right. But there's a wall there, the girl asked. He replied that he would fix it now. Mule crashed with all his speed into it and broke it. The others froze without realizing what had happened. Wai Jun shouted to his men to quickly rush after them. Kyung asked if Mule was okay, let her be patient a little longer. Suddenly they saw a dead end, the girl asked if maybe he should at least get some rest. If he tried to pull the blade out of the wound, the blood would start pouring non-stop. Kyun suddenly cried, she said let her ignore it. Mule said he was just trying to understand, was he the reason she was crying? The girl said yes. What's the point of all this if he's going to die? It's always the same. Something bad happens to the people around her. Did she still think it was because of the curse? How much danger had they already been through in the last three weeks? And they overcame everything together and are still alive. That's usually called luck. In the moment, the girl realized that she was indeed lucky, not cursed. Does she remember the first time they met? When he went down the cliff to pick up the silk, he noticed something odd about the cart. There were clearly visible signs of intentional damage to the device used to secure the axle. Kyung borrowed this cart before the struggle for the throne began. The same things have happened to her before, the fact that the bathroom floor collapsed like that is also suspicious. This whole thing with her siblings only started recently, so it seems like someone was trying to kill her long before that. She realized she already knew that. And she knows who tried to kill her. The lizard has already lost a lot of blood. Now they are inside the salt mine, so this time they won't be able to break through the wall again and escape. He gave the order to kill them. Kyung realized that so be it, she couldn't blame the curse in this situation. If she dies, it will only be her own fault. Mule said he would now see what happens next. He means with her luck, suddenly a huge blue portal appeared in front of them blinding their eyes. It's that magic stingray, he said his name was Pajihi. Siran Mule would be elected. Everyone around them was shocked at what they heard. How could this be? Wai Jun told his men that they were so close, what was the hesitation? Are they going to regret not joining the Knolls? What nonsense! Let them take up their spears and bows and shoot them now. Pajihi said there will be many obstacles in Mule's path. The lizard asked, only five in their tribe were chosen so does that make him chosen as the new number six? Or did someone die? He replied that the stargazer had left this world. Mule is the second bravest lizard in his tribe. That's enough to become the chosen one. He will now follow God's will. By doing his will, the lizard can borrow God's power, 
starting now. After saying that, Pajihi disappeared before their eyes. Jun's men moved into the battle, no one could save them now. However, now having Divine Power Mule pulled out the maple and immediately set his wound on fire to stop the bleeding. Despite being in so much pain, he feels a surge of tremendous energy. These people don't seem to understand what's really going on. Kyung thinks so too. Mule said then we'd have to explain it all to them on our fingers. Many of his men fell in front of his eyes from Mule's electric wave, some decided to run away brokenly. Why Jun realized that now the forces were not equal and decided to run away with the others. That's just incredible power. Kyung asked how the lizard was feeling. He replied that he was fine. She wondered why, with such power, the lizards had not yet exterminated the gnolls. Said he couldn't give an answer to that question yet. Mule doesn't think he can use this power indefinitely, and feels like it's consuming some of his mental energy. I think he understands Owen now, because he often smokes a pipe after using force. Kyung asked again, is he sure he's okay? Mule replied that he was just tired. But, he could still fight. The bleeding had been stopped and he was feeling better. They decided to move on, and there were a few more enemy men on their way. The lizard quickly put them to bed. Hegemony has been watching all of this closely. He cannot allow events to continue in this vein. I didn't want to resort to this, but I have to. This should stop them. A huge saber-toothed tiger stood in their way. Mule didn't understand why it was there. Maybe he climbed up the wall and then went down the salt mine? Anyway, Mule's strength is much more powerful and he had no trouble defeating this tiger. Kyung said she realizes that so much hell has happened in the last few days. She thinks this is just another manifestation of it. The biggest worry is what awaits them outside, since her brother is still alive. When they finally got outside, they saw him immediately. He shouted for them to be damned. They made him do that. Kyung asks who started this whole mess, then? June thinks it's all her fault. Bringing that damn lizard into the castle. The battle for the inheritance was only supposed to break out between brothers. If she becomes the heir while using the power of outsiders, does she think things will remain the same in the autonomous city? The humans will be forced out of the castle and the lizards will take over. Kyung asked, did he think it was all her fault? Why Jun shouted to his men that it was enough to listen to their lies. Let them kill them. However, the lizard quickly dispatched them. He was confused, how did he have so much stamina in him? The lizard should have fainted from blood loss and exhaustion. Why Kyung shouted that his brother is a real idiot. He doesn't even understand the reasons for what's happening. An autonomous city is a castle that lives and thrives on trade alone. If it does not establish ties with its nearest neighbors, it will be cut off from them and will be left without a market. Did the guy still not realize that the whole environment was trying to control them? If he's so smart, he should have guessed that, and use them in return. Unlike him and her father, she's not a coward. She is ready to take the autonomous city to the next level. Why June smiled and said that the girl not only looks like one of them but also thinks differently, her thoughts are poisoned. Either way, let her know that he never thought of her as a sister. The girl noticed that June suddenly opened the fan. Was this some kind of signal? The only place to hide unnoticed is in front of the warehouse. It's too far to throw a dagger so it'll have to be a bow or crossbow. The inner voice said the arrow had an iron tip and three feathers. It's aimed at her heart. Hopes she's not going to gag her when she's one step away from death. If nothing is done, they'll both die. Or does he think he can stop the arrow? Too slow, Mule reacted too, but too late, he wouldn't get a save. She could have warned her when she spotted the assassin, then her horns hadn't fully grown back yet. Now let her try to imagine how she could have avoided getting hit. Kyung said she didn't know, maybe the wind would suddenly blow and a gust would deflect the arrow? The voice replied that wind is good, the wind is always on her side. Uncertainty grows, understands? In an instant, the arrow that was supposed to pierce her heart just whirled and steamed through the air. But what is it this time? A curse or a stroke of luck? The voice replied that it was much more complicated than that, and did not fit into those two simple concepts. She sees an infinite number of diverging paths in the future and chooses those that lead to the best outcome. Kyung can control probability. She is enveloped in a canopy of demonic energy, 
and now recognize the essence of demonic nature. Hegemony's jaw nearly dropped, wasn't she cursed? Nebula replied, did he think him so stupid that he would choose a cursed child? But how could that be possible? The description of the character's backstory clearly states that she has a curse on her. And how come it's suddenly not a curse, but a demonic spirit? Did he interfere and edit the description of her biography? Nebula said the description of her background hasn't changed since she and he came into this world. However, he wondered how Hegemony had been able to find out that she was a demon? After all, he himself, had not been sure of that from the beginning. Even initially thought it was a curse of bad luck. But, it turned out that countless random accidents were actually attempted assassinations. Nebula found out about it the time she fell through the toilet. It was the servant who damaged the boards before Wai Kyung went in there. She had already gotten it in her head that she wouldn't be able to go for a proper bath after this incident. However, no matter how it was, from every such situation, even when death seemed imminent, Kyung got out alive and unharmed. In that moment, Nebula realized that by watching her, he would be able to know what lurked within her. That's how he came to the conclusion that it's not a curse of bad luck. Rather, it was the blessing of great good fortune. Something called the magic of probability. Having a being possessed by a demonic spirit is a huge advantage in itself. But, uh, that's over now. Hegemony said he was a bit toad strangled when he splurged on summoning a saber-toothed tiger, but it was worth it, the victory was his. Nebula replied that it sounded pathetic, but who said he won, since Nebula hasn't killed Wai Jun yet? Is there anything else he could do? Morning came and Lord Wee Seo returned. He told his children to stop. The hegemony thinks it's over. Yco has returned, which means only one thing, all the families inside the castle must immediately end their confrontation. He wants to get everything sorted out as quickly as possible, and just name the next successor. And it might even happen right now. Yseo will appoint Yjun as his heir. Because they have similar views on how to run the city. And if that happens, there's nothing Yikyung can do about it. There's no point in killing YSEO. The families won't support someone who does that. Nebula asked, but what if he's wrong? Why is he so sure that YCO will appoint June as the heir? The man said there was no need to fight anymore. He will appoint his heir right here and now. Kyung thinks she should tell him something before that happens. Her father noticed her horns, the daughter let them grow back. And Kyung noticed that he had shaved off his beard. Kyung asked, all this time he had been trying to kill her? The man froze in place, unsure of what to do next. But how, when had she managed to find out? The girl answered that a long time ago, but all this time she had been deceiving herself, and did not want to believe it. Why would her father torture her to kill her? Because of the fact that her mother died giving birth to her? Because of the cursed mark that has haunted her all her life? even though that rumor was created by him. Her father replied that her mother wanted to leave her life to her, for she was very weak. That's why she died of mountain fever after the baby girl was born. Why Rio was special to him. He couldn't accept losing her. It hurt more than she could ever imagine. And at that moment, the word curse swirled in his head. The father then chose to justify that his wife died because of a curse brought into their home from her birth with those horns. His days as ruler of the castle had become unbearable. She was always looming in front of him, the one who took away his most precious possession. That's why YSEO couldn't leave her behind. The girl said enough was enough, that was all she wanted to know. Now let her do what she wants. Why Jun shouted to his father that the legacy would determine the fate of the autonomous city. You can't let guilt influence his decision. The man replied not to worry. Even though he was an old, battered man, but, when it comes to such things, he will make the decision as the lord of the autonomous city, not as his father. Man is just a bargaining chip for a game of go, thrown on the board by the will of the gods. This will be his last voluntary decision. And so he chooses. Hegemony started praying to all the gods and Buddha. Nebula grinned and said that wouldn't work, they were the gods here. Suddenly, Nebula saw the outline of dark magic. It looked like it needed a closer look. The voice told Kyung, his upper lip stretching, his father wants to say her name. She would be the one to be the ruler. However, she looks worried, why is that? 
Kyung replied that her father is avoiding the problem. Even she doesn't know herself completely, and he chooses a path that will allow him to absolve some of the guilt. Later, this story will spread around the castle. The ruler tried to kill his own child, and because of his guilt he left him in power. Those who support Wai Jun will actively spread this rumor. And then everyone will wonder if she even deserves it. They'll say she's just lucky to be the ruler. The four major families, well, the commoners won't follow her. And her position will quickly be jeopardized. Kyung decided that she shouldn't be appointed heir by her father. She needs to achieve this title on her own. 